I couldn't help but think that the drive up to our small, isolated cabin felt more eerie than usual. The winding road, framed by twisted and gnarled old trees, seemed to stretch on forever. I'd made this trip countless times before. My family had been coming to our cabin in the Appalachian Mountains since I was a kid. Now in my thirties, it was a place where I could gather my thoughts and connect with my Cheyenne heritage. My name is Tala Vasquez. I was born and raised in North Dakota, on the reservation where my parents met. My mother moved back to her native Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Reservation after my father passed away because she wanted to be closer to her family. Growing up, I always admired her strength and independence. I had brought two of my closest friends along on this trip, Kyle and Ellie, thinking it would be good for them to experience some of the serenity I felt when in the solitude of nature. As we finally arrived at the cabin, Unloading the car, our laughter echoed through the trees, filling the air with warmth. We set about starting a campfire out behind the cabin as dusk crept over the forest like a ravenous creature, ready to consume what little light remained. Seated around the fire, conversations deepened while we shared stories about each other's lives and divulged secrets that had been locked away within our hearts for years. As night settled in completely, we began to hear faint rustling sounds emanating from behind the tree line. Initially not overly concerned, knowing a lot of innocent animals roamed these woods, we continued talking amongst ourselves until the noises grew louder and more intense. It seemed as if they were methodically moving closer to us. Kyle jokingly said that maybe it was time for us to call it a night and lock ourselves in for safety's sake, but his nervous laughter betrayed any sense of conviction. Soon after, we decided to head inside, a general feeling of unease settling upon the group as we locked the door behind us. Inside the cabin, the atmosphere had changed. It was as if we couldn't escape the oppressive darkness that haunted us outside. We were jumpy, trying to lighten the mood but unable to shake an unexplainable anxiety. By midnight, we had all somehow convinced ourselves that it was just our nerves and imaginations getting the better of us. We settled on our makeshift beds in the small living area of the cabin, planning to sleep off our irrational fears. That was when we heard it, deliberate scratches against the wooden walls like those of claws perpetually dragging across every inch of the structure that wrapped around us. The sound instilled pure terror in each one of us. This wasn't something we could easily rationalize or ignore any longer. Unable to downplay this creeping dread, we whispered hurriedly about what to do next when suddenly, a deafening crash splintered through the silence. The wall at the far end of the cabin came crashing down, revealing a monstrous creature standing among the chaos. Bathed in moonlight, it appeared almost human-like, with coarse hair covering its body and massive limbs capable of crushing bone. Its eyes glinted, intelligent and malevolent, as they locked onto each one of us. I yanked a rifle from above the fireplace mantle while Kyle and Ellie panicked for cover. While I'm no expert marksman, I'd been taught by my father how to handle firearms responsibly. Despite barely having had time to process what I was facing before me, my hands worked furiously, loading ammunition into my weapon as holy beads of sweat seemingly poured from my brow. With what felt like false bravado, I released a loud yelp and pulled the trigger missing my mark completely but startling this abominable titan as it clearly had not expected such a resistance from prey. The creature may have been momentarily stunned by my actions, but it quickly revealed its incredible agility as it charged towards me with a guttural growl. The confrontation that followed was swift and brutal. My friends and I somehow managed to fend it off despite our overwhelming dread and inexperience. The three of us lay in tatters amongst the wreckage of our beloved cabin, 
nursing wounds both physical and emotional as we realized that we could not linger amongst this vile beast's territory. Drenched in blood, sweat, and fear, we hastily packed our belongings, piled into the car, and fled back down that winding road. Our hearts raced in unison with the engine's roar. The haunting image of that monstrous creature was burned into our minds ensuring our nightmares would be plagued by its grotesque visage for years to come. As we sped away from the cabin, we couldn't help but wonder what exactly it was that we had encountered. Upon returning home, we consulted every source available in an attempt to identify the beast, trawling through ancient folklore and texts as well as online communities dedicated to cryptozoology. Our search led us to a tale older than time, one that spoke of a malevolent creature that stalked the Appalachian Mountains known as the Wendigo. Legend has it that the Wendigo was once human but transformed into a ravenous fiend by consuming the flesh of another person, forever cursed to roam these woods to satiate its insatiable hunger for human prey. The more we delved into this mystery, the more we felt a sense of responsibility to confront the horror we left behind in those Appalachian woods for ourselves and for others who may unknowingly stumble upon our family cabin, this time armed with knowledge and a newfound determination that bound us together more than ever before. It was just another Tuesday night when everything changed for me. June 3, 2014, a date I'll never forget I was sitting at the dive bar I often frequented after work, feeling a vague anxiety growing in the pit of my stomach. My name is Kyson Whitebear, by the way. Let me tell you a bit about myself. I'm a Cheyenne American, born and raised in a small town called Tacoma in Colorado. I moved to Portland for better career opportunities and occasional visits to the city's hot spots. But back to that eerie night, as I sipped on my cold beer, little did I know that darkness approached. A middle-aged man walked into the dimly lit bar with some kind of limp on his left leg. We exchanged glances and friendly nods, nothing out of the ordinary. His name was Rod Mullins an ex-cop who volunteered at a Bigfoot exhibition downtown. In between sharing stories about broken laws and lost jobs, Rod mentioned something that sent chills down my spine, sightings of a massive creature lurking in the nearby woods. Believing him to be just another guy trying to scare me, I took his story lightly and dismissed it with a chuckle. The conversation shifted topics soon enough. The following Saturday found me enjoying my typical solo hike in the serene yet dense forests outside Portland. It was great for clearing my head after a long week of work. Something felt off from the start, though. Unsettling sounds echoed through the trees. Unusual disturbances shook this familiar sanctuary of mine. At first, it was just crunching leaves and snapping branches nearby not particularly pleasant while alone in the woods. As I trudged further into unknown territory, it struck me how isolated this journey had become, miles from civilization, miles from help if anything went wrong. I shrugged off those uncomfortable thoughts and pressed forward to balance the strange feelings against my insatiable curiosity. And that's when I first heard footsteps, not human but something terrifyingly different. I held my breath, frozen with dread, as the limping beast slowly approached, following me without hesitation. Paralyzed in fear, I didn't dare move. It was massive, nearly nine feet tall, with disheveled reddish-brown fur. Its eyes were like black and pits staring right into my soul. The creature carried an overwhelming odor of blood and filth with every step it took. My heart pounded relentlessly as panic overtook my senses. Was this Bigfoot? How could such a mythical creature be roaming these woods so close to where I lived? 
As I tried to gather my thoughts and form a plan, the creature lunged forward with alarming speed and ferocity. I sprinted as fast as I could back towards civilization, but I felt acutely aware that it was much faster than any human could hope to outrun initially. Thankfully, adrenaline kicked in, and sheer determination propelled me forward. It took every ounce of strength and resourcefulness to avoid stepping into traps the beast seemingly skillfully placed in my path, from gruesome animal carcasses meant to slow me down to thickets of thorns hidden just out of plain sight. Finally, gasping for air and drenched in sweat, I emerged into a familiar neighborhood on the outskirts of Portland. The sight of houses brought relief, as if I had narrowly escaped death itself. I've hardly slept since that night, haunted by memories of that horrendous creature and its sheer malevolence. With constant nightmares plaguing my sleep, what little solitude I had vanished, until a phone call from Rod brought clarity. It turns out there were others like me who had witnessed this large foot lurking in those same woods over the years. They found comfort through shared experiences at meetings held at his Bigfoot Exhibition Center downtown, a support group, so to speak. And as I stared at the faces around the table at our first meeting, some of them scarred, others showing signs of years of guilt, I realized that what I encountered in the woods was more horrifying and real than anything I could have imagined. As the weeks went by, our group became a solace and a source of strength for each of us who had encountered the terrifying creature in the woods. We began working together to collect evidence, building a case to convince law enforcement and wildlife experts of large fruits existence. Each individual brought their own specialization to the table, from an outdoorsman skilled in tracking to a journalist with connections to local media. It was through our collective effort that we began to slowly unravel the mystery shrouding this enigmatic beast. Our investigation led us to several discoveries about large fruits' behavior and movements. As we pieced together evidence from various sources, such as old police reports, newspaper clippings, and interviews, it became clear that frequent sightings occurred during periods of significant environmental change or disturbance like logging activities or massive storms. Following up on these findings, we began exploring deeper into its habitat and discovered several large caves dotted with alarming signs of the creature's presence, from claw marks gouged deep into rock walls to scattered remnants of its prey. In time, our mission gradually shifted from merely validating large fruit's existence toward identifying its origin protecting it from potential hunters, and finding a way to coexist peacefully. Local media picked up on our efforts, and soon enough, we received both support and backlash from people in the community. Slowly, but surely, more individuals started acknowledging the creature's existence as more than just folklore and joined us in our quest for understanding. Despite the inevitable fears and challenges we faced along the way, our united perseverance continued to reveal secrets hidden deep within those dark forests, uncovering truths about large foot that had remained elusive for generations. And as I now recount those harrowing moments spent outwitting death in pursuit of answers, I can't help but look back with a sense of irony at that fateful night in a dive bar when everything changed. What once seemed terrifying now serves as a constant reminder of the unlikely journey it set into motion and a life forever dedicated to unraveling the truth. I still remember that night like it was yesterday. It was October 17th and I was heading out to visit my buddy Charlie, who lived just outside the small town of Antler Creek. I'm Aiden Tallbear, a Cheyenne native with a strong connection to my roots, but in that moment, I couldn't imagine how they'd become so terrifyingly entwined with the events that unfolded. 
Anyway, I pulled into Charlie's driveway around 8 p.m. The sun had just sunk beneath the horizon, and the forest surrounding his house cast eerie shadows all around us that seemed innocuous at first. We were just two old friends catching up over a few drinks in his living room, talking about work and reminiscing about our childhood shenanigans. It hadn't been long when we heard strange noises coming from outside. At first, we dismissed them as nothing more than nocturnal creatures stirring in the darkness. However, as time passed, the noises grew louder and more distressing, guttural growls accompanied by the sound of heavy breathing. We decided to take a look but found nothing out there when we cautiously stepped onto his porch. A few minutes later, Charlie's dog Milo began barking loudly and aggressively. I had never seen him like this before. All his fur was standing on end, and he was focused on something deeper in the woods across from us. Fear began to rise within me as I tried to make sense of what was going on, but Charlie insisted it was probably just a bear or some other wild animal passing through. The following morning, we discovered what could only be described as mutilated animal carcasses scattered throughout the surrounding woods during our search for Milo, who had disappeared during the night. We immediately contacted Sheriff Darlene Cullen, who took notes and sent us back home, assuring us it could have been a swiftly embellished dramatic drunk's tale, or just wild animals fighting for territory. We spent the entire day cleaning and disposing of the gruesome remains, trying to maintain a sense of normalcy and skeptical control. Throughout the ordeal, we noticed strange tracks leading deeper into the woods but could not decipher what kind of creature had left them. Our uneasy night of rest was interrupted when Charlie's phone rang. It was Sheriff Cullen, pale and shaken. She told us that other bizarre sightings and disturbing mutilations had been reported in nearby areas, with eerie similarities to ours. Her normally pragmatic attitude couldn't hide her genuine concern, and she revealed that folks around town believed it to be the doing of the infamous Skinwalker, a notorious creature with shape-shifting abilities long held within American native folklore. Everything fell into place when Charlie's neighbor Mark, a seasoned outdoorsman familiar with local legends, visited us that afternoon. Conversations turned into shared experiences, and his blood ran cold as he told us of his close encounter with a beast like no other, bloodshot eyes, razor-sharp claws, and an aura of pure terror. The mention of a skinwalker left both Charlie and me questioning our skeptical natures. A week later, Folks continued reporting mutilated animals, isolated structures vandalized, relentless howling sounds throughout the woods, and traces found atop trees, hard to ignore evidence that something unnatural prowled our backyard. We decided to set traps and monitor cameras, hoping to capture undeniable proof for authorities who remained unconvinced by superstitious stories. It took another chilling experience for me to recognize that sometimes we need to entertain illogical thoughts, especially when evidence is increasing at an alarming rate, from elements you'd never dream existed, as we found ourselves in a deadly game between chaos disrupting innocent lives while the secret gasps for breath, leaving anyone who witnessed its glance craving relief from profound trauma. And that's how it all began. The frightening chain of events marked by the stalking shadow whose existence evades explanation. It was only when the sheriff ended up unconscious and heavily scarred that they heard the restless whispers of locals and finally gathered enough witnesses to initiate investigations into a true American native legend, the Skinwalker. The town shivered on edge, waiting as we grappled with the darkness whispered at the fireside until an old man explained its dreaded origin after returning from a relative's funeral. But for now, we're left in fear of what could be lurking right outside our doors, a monster only faceless and hiding. As we continued to struggle with the unbelievable reality we found ourselves in, 
people around town began to tie even the smallest unexplained occurrences to the terrifying legend of the skinwalker. Paranormal curiosity quickly turned into crippling paranoia, with everyone striving to encrypt themselves within their own small fortress. Some even resorted to ancient rituals and protection spells handed down from their ancestors, hoping they would shield them from this elusive horror. Meanwhile, Charlie and I spent countless nights poring over books, articles, and internet forums, trying to uncover any information that could help us understand and eventually stop this force that had plagued our town. As a Cheyenne native myself, I reached out to my elders and community members for their knowledge and wisdom on the enigmatic being. They were hesitant at first, well aware of the dangers associated with speaking about such entities, but eventually revealed stories of similar occurrences, often traced back to cursed individuals or sacred burial grounds disturbed by unwarranted encroachments. With every sleepless night that passed, the Skinwalker continued its menacing activities, new sightings, strange tracks left behind, and increasing mutilations. The atmosphere in Antler Creek grew heavier as contention started to develop amongst the townsfolk, some seeking unity in times of unrest while others pointed accusatory fingers at those who dared dig deeper into the ancient legend. The line between reality and superstition blurred as fear turned neighbors against each other. Equipped with newly acquired knowledge from both research and communal memory sharing from our tribe's contemporaries, Charlie and I decided it was time to face the beast head-on, if not for our immediate safety, then for generations left to contend upon these haunted lands with memories carved in pain-streaked souls. A decision was finally made. We joined forces with Mark, Sheriff Cullen, and a few other dedicated townspeople driven either by courage or a primal sense of survival instincts. By embarking on an endeavor shrouded in trepidation, we set out to confront the terror that descended upon our once peaceful town. Our hearts were heavy, yet our minds were fearlessly determined. We prepared for a battle we never thought we'd face and hoped for a narrow escape back into the life of tranquility that existed just before October 17th. I couldn't believe what had happened that summer of 2008. I was just chilling with my buddies, Levin and Keandre, at a quaint diner in Crowheart, Wyoming. We were on our way back from a hunting trip when we decided to stop for some hot coffee and fresh blueberry pie. It wasn't hard to notice the slight unease among the locals when we walked in, but being a Cheyenne American native myself, I didn't pay much attention to it. My name is Calder Greywolf, and back then, I was an avid outdoorsman. Levin and Keandre were longtime friends of mine and seasoned hunters as well, so our bond was primarily based on our love for nature and adventures. We regularly explored the wilderness together, escaping the monotony of everyday life. Little did we know that this trip would be unlike any other. As we continued eating, we overheard whispers between an elderly couple sitting a few tables away from us. They spoke about Nabiacs, something they said had been watching the town at night. Curious by nature, I asked the old-timers about Nabiacs before leaving the diner, what it was or if there were any stories or legends surrounding it. The elderly man refused to talk about it but warned us sternly not to meddle in things that didn't concern us. Brushing off the old man's advice as mere superstition and fueled by our curiosity, we decided to stake out around the town that night. As twilight fell, Levin suggested we park near an abandoned construction site close to the woods, as he believed it could be Nabiac's hideout due to recent sightings there. We stayed silent for hours without encountering anything odd. Then suddenly, 
Keandre whispered under his breath that he saw something moving behind a stack of wooden boards near the tree line. As we cautiously approached the area, we discovered the grisly remains of a man in torn clothes, his throat ripped open and covered in dried blood. The shock immediately set in, and our senses were heightened. Levin, closest to the body, stepped back and almost tripped on what looked like an unidentifiable organ lying on the ground next to the mutilated corpse. Keandre gathered his courage and examined it, only to confirm that it was indeed a human liver. As we tried to make sense of what we had stumbled upon, through my peripheral vision, I caught a glimpse of a dark figure lurking behind the trees. There it was, Nabiax. A bent humanoid creature with bulbous eyes and claws dripping with thick saliva. It let out an eerie snarl as it prepared to lunge toward us. We quickly regrouped and made our escape through the woods. At one point, Keandre tripped over a gnarled root but managed to grab onto my arm. We ran with all our might until we reached our truck and drove away from the horrors that had unfolded before us. Days later, after sharing our encounter with a few others around town, we learned more about the Nabiaks from a tribal elder who lived nearby. It was supposedly a malevolent creature that bore grotesque features only seen in the most horrifying folklore tales. Nobody knew where it came from or what its motives were. With that information in hand and still haunted by what had happened on that night of terror, I swore never to doubt legends and myths again, especially when innocent lives are at stake. Over the following weeks, we decided to investigate the Nabiax further, wanting to understand its origin and put an end to its menace. We reached out to other tribal elders and researchers, piecing together a web of ancient lore and modern sightings. We discovered that similar horrors had been whispered about for generations, not just in Crowheart but all over the country, with chilling accounts strikingly similar to our own. Driven by a newfound sense of responsibility, we formed a group committed to uncovering the truth, venturing deeper into hidden corners of a world we hadn't fully understood. As we devoted more hours to our cause, our lives began to take on an entirely new purpose. Hesitantly at first, but with growing resolve, we enlisted other outdoors enthusiasts and experts in folklore, people like us who felt compelled to expose this hidden terror. Under the cover of darkness, we conducted methodical search and rescue missions in areas plagued by disappearances or laden with local legends. Some nights were fruitless. Others brimmed with heart-stopping revelations that left us questioning our understanding of reality altogether. Each new encounter sent shockwaves throughout our tightly knit community. But rather than dissuade our efforts, these experiences only served to strengthen our resolve. Through it all, Levin, Keandre, and I maintained the bond we shared from those first adventures in the wilderness. Our quest had evolved from seeking isolation amongst nature's beauty into striving to protect the innocent from danger lurking in the shadows, but our camaraderie remained unshaken. The summer of 2008 would undoubtedly go down as a turning point in our lives, when three ordinary hunters inadvertently stepped beyond the veil separating mankind from supernatural terror and took it upon themselves to safeguard those on either side from the wrath of Nabiax. I couldn't believe what I was getting myself into. My name is Kayla Nyana, a Cheyenne native from Montana. I'd found myself at my cousin's place in rural Indiana for an extended weekend, a place I'd never been before. Little did I know how that first night would spiral into terrifying darkness. It all started as we sat outside his home, catching up while enjoying a few cold beers and laughing at each other's jokes. We just lit up a couple of cheap cigars when I noticed something strange out of the corner of my eye. What's up with those weird marks on the fence? 
I asked casually, pointing towards the scorched, jagged markings that seemed to have appeared since our arrival earlier in the day. My cousin, Devin, looked at me strangely and shook his head. Dude, they were there this morning when we got here. You just noticed them now? I'd always prided myself on being observant, but maybe the trip had taken more out of me than I realized. Weird was all I could say before we moved on from the topic. The sun had long set by the time we heard it, a low growl echoing through the trees that quickly escalated to an unnerving howl. This wasn't any type of animal I'd ever encountered, and you could see Devin tense up alongside me. Okay, seriously, man, he whispered under his breath. What the fuck is that? It wasn't long before we got our answer. A creature emerged from the shadows of the woods, resembling a twisted mix between a wolf and an emaciated bear covered in patches of mangy fur. Its enormous teeth glinted in the moonlight as it snarled fiercely and rushed towards us. Panicking and stumbling over each other in haste, Devin and I raced back into the house, locking the door behind us. This thing, though, wasn't your typical monster. It clawed through the door as if it were made of paper. With moments to spare, we escaped through the back door and ran to a neighboring house belonging to an old-timer named Jed who had lived in this area for decades. He barricaded us in and told us he'd seen this creature before but didn't know its origin or what it wanted. He called it the Shawnee Nightmare, some twisted creation from native folklore. Soon enough, it was at his door, too, snarling and clawing an opening through the wooden barrier. We hastily made our way to the basement as the hideous monstrosity broke into Jed's house, engaging in a fierce fight with his two German shepherds, who died trying to protect us. Desperate and cornered, we had one more trick up our sleeves. Jed had rigged a powerful trap in the basement, jars of gasoline and a tripwire used as a backup plan during a violent home invasion scare years ago. The Shawnee Nightmare barreled down the stairs after us, igniting the trap with one misplaced step. A fiery explosion shot through the basement and engulfed everything in sight. Managing to escape through a window moments before the flames consumed the house completely, Devin and I stood outside panting and shaking from our terrifying ordeal as sirens filled the air. Days later, after speaking with local historians about our encounter, we discovered that mysterious deaths and brutal attacks had long plagued this region. In recent years, they've largely been dismissed as random acts of violence or unfortunate accidents. We know better now. As for the name Shiny Nightmare? Just that, lost folklore that had scared generations of local families into secret whispered conversations around campfires late at night. But now, between clenched teeth and haunted gazes, the townspeople no longer needed whispers. They knew. And we knew right alongside them that some mysteries are better left buried and unnamed. In the aftermath of that horrifying night, Life would never be the same for Devon and me. We tried our best to return to some semblance of normalcy, but the trauma of our encounter with the Shawnee Nightmare had left its mark on us. Sleepless nights, haunted by nightmares and visions of the creature, became our new reality. The once close-knit community now seemed more distant, fearing what lurked among them in the darkness. Locals whispered about leaving their homes and abandoning their land in search of safer pastures. But for Devon and me, there was a different path. We made it our mission to research this creature further, delving into old texts and forgotten records in hopes of discovering its origin and whether there was any way to ensure it would never resurface again. Teaming up with Jed, we set out on a perilous journey to uncover the truth behind the long-standing curse of the Shawnee Nightmare. Little did we know at that time how far down the rabbit hole this quest would take us.
It all started on a seemingly ordinary day in my hometown of Cheyenne, Wyoming. I just finished work at the local auto shop and decided to go for a hike in the nearby Medicine Bow National Forest. Little did I know my evening walk would turn into a nightmare I'd never forget. My name is Wako Adin Talchief, a proud member of the Cheyenne tribe. I grew up in this area, hiking, hunting, and exploring every inch of these forests and surrounding lands. My parents instilled in me a deep respect for nature, tradition, and the spiritual realm. I've had my fair share of odd experiences in the woods, but nothing quite like this. As the evening approached, I took to the familiar forest trail with my buddy Rourke Harjo, another Cheyenne native. We were joking around and catching up on each other's lives swapping stories about work and love interests. Amidst our banter, we stumbled upon a peculiar-looking symbol carved into a tree trunk. It looked old, like it had been there for years, but somehow managed to escape our notice until now. Rourke looked uneasy and muttered something about bad omens as we continued walking deeper into the forest. As dust settled over us, an eerie silence began to set in no birds chirping or rustling leaves from regular critters. It felt as if time was standing still. With twilight fading quickly, we turned on our flashlights to navigate the dense foliage overgrown on what was once a well-trodden path. Suddenly we heard something big crashing through the underbrush nearby, its presence eerily silent until that moment. We were no strangers to bears or large animals in these woods, but this felt different. Racing hearts pounding in our chests, Rourke whispered, I've heard legends of Lelito Vakovii. In ancient folklore, it's a monstrous shape-shifting creature that terrorizes our people, stalking and hunting them like prey. I scoffed at his claim, not ready to believe in old myths. We kept walking, trying to shake off the growing dread that something was definitely wrong. Our lives had been ordinary, and we never felt threatened in these familiar woods. That was all about to change. As the night pressed on, we spotted mutilated animal carcasses scattered about, their remains picked clean as if a beast starving for months had feasted upon them. Suddenly, a blood-curling shriek echoed through the darkness, followed by snapping twigs. Rourke's eyes grew wide as fear drowned out skepticism, and he whispered urgently, This is no bear or animal. We're not alone. Our steps became more cautious, flashlights darting back and forth for any trace of movement. It was becoming clear we were being hunted, taunted even, as the mutilated creatures grew larger and fresher with each ghastly encounter. Panic locked between our ribs as Rourke suggested turning back but doubling our pace in an attempt to shake off this unseen predator. That's when it revealed itself, Lelito Vukovii, emerging from the shadows like a nightmarish vision manifested from folklore, a hulking figure with piercing eyes and razor-sharp claws dripping with blood. It lunged at Rourke sinking its claws into his flesh before unleashing an ear-piercing screech and disappearing into the darkness once more. Breathing heavily amid sobs, Rourke managed to reveal he had heard whispers of this creature years ago, but never believed it held any truth. Battered but alive, we death-marched for what felt like miles until we stumbled upon an isolated ranger's station. Bursting inside, we relayed our horrifying story to the incredulous but concerned ranger, who informed us that several unsolved disappearances had been linked to the nearby woods. As Rourke lay there battered and shaken, it was only then that I realized Lelito Vukovii wasn't just a figment of our imagination or a silly story. It was an all-consuming force, selecting its victims, toying with them, and dragging them into oblivion. We survived that night but will forever carry the burden of knowing such a creature exists, lurking in the shadows while disbelief keeps us blind. In the years that followed our harrowing encounter, 
both Rourke and I became consumed by the need to inform others about the dangers lurking within the medicine-bound national forest. We wanted to prevent anyone else from falling victim to the insidious Lelito Vukovii that haunted our homeland. We began researching other cases of missing hikers, hunters, and campers, forming connections in a desperate attempt to find answers. Our search led us deep into the history and legends of our tribe, unearthing forgotten stories and cautionary tales that had been passed down through generations. Despite our dedication to this quest, we struggled with disbelief from our own people, who dismissed Lelito Vukovia as a myth and warned us against serving misplaced fears. As time went on, word of our experiences slowly started gaining traction among a mix of skeptics, paranormal enthusiasts, and fellow tribesmen who had witnessed similar occurrences. Our journey had transformed us into accidental experts on the creature, its vile nature, relentless stalking tactics, and seemingly unending appetite for torment. With each new case we uncovered our personal connection we made with another survivor, we became more committed to shedding light on this dark enigma. Even though Rourke's physical scars eventually healed, we both carried deep emotional wounds that only the pursuit of justice could ever hope to mend. With a newfound appreciation for our tribe's ancient knowledge and an unyielding determination to protect our people from future tragedy, we continued to delve deeper into the world of Lelito Vukovii, learning everything we could about its origins and possible weaknesses in our relentless pursuit to eradicate this lurking menace from our ancestral lands for good. It was around 7 p.m. on a Friday when I decided to pay a visit to my buddy Pete after work. We hadn't seen each other in months and thought it'd be the perfect time to catch up over a few beers. As a Cheyenne Native American, Pete has always intrigued me with his traditional stories and innate connection to nature. I knocked on his door, which swung open almost immediately. Ah, Kieran! It's been way too long! Pete exclaimed as he ushered me inside. We settled down in his living room reminiscing about our high school days and all the stupid things we used to do, like those competitive beer-chugging sessions that would inevitably result in one of us throwing up. An hour into our chat I realized I'd left my phone in my car and excused myself to retrieve it. As I stepped out into the dimly lit street, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off, something that made the hairs on my neck stand on edge. I noticed a man standing at the end of the street just staring at me. He seemed familiar, but somehow he appeared different than anyone else around him, like he didn't quite belong there, or perhaps I just hadn't seen him before. My curiosity peaked, and I decided to approach him cautiously. As I got closer, his face finally emerged from the darkness, and it finally dawned on me who this man was. Just as his features began growing clearer, he suddenly turned and vanished into thin air. Shaken by the bizarre encounter, I practically sprinted back into Pete's house. Panting heavily, I tried explaining what had happened outside, but Pete just shook his head dismissively, saying, Kieran, you've always been one for crazy tales. Swearing off alcohol for the night, at least for now, we switched our focus to an old movie Pete had been meaning to watch for ages. Finally, once the credits rolled, Pete abruptly frowned at the screen. Do you remember that old Cheyenne legend about Nayani the Soul Stalker? He asked, his voice an undeniable quiver. I've been hearing rumors lately, people in town saying that they've seen him prowling the roads here, feeding off of people's souls. My heart dropped. No way, I whispered, my eyes a mixture of fear and sadness as I recalled the creepy figure outside just an hour ago. Suddenly, there was a knock at our door. 
We exchanged wary glances before Pete hesitantly opened the door. To our shock, standing outside was our old friend Jesse, except he looked nothing like the Jesse we knew. His eyes were hollowed out, and he appeared completely lifeless. We were attacked by something. Jesse mumbled weakly before collapsing on Pete's doorstep. Panic set in as we tried reviving him. But it was too late. Jesse was gone. For weeks, we searched for answers, digging up every old legend and talking to all of Jesse's acquaintances from his final days. The stories all led back to Naani, the soul stalker. While we couldn't be sure of who or what this creature was, everything that transpired over those horrifying weeks seemed too real and horrifyingly logical to dismiss as mere folklore. As much closure as we got from realizing who our tormentor was, it didn't lessen the pain of losing Jesse or the bone-chilling fear gnawing away at us each time night descended upon our town. It's been years since that harrowing ordeal. Not a single day goes by where I don't catch myself glancing over my shoulder in fear, wondering if Neani is still lurking beneath the dark veil that wraps itself around our quiet street each night. And deep down, I can't help but wonder if we'll ever truly be safe from the Soul Stalker's wrath. Time passed, and life slowly returned to some semblance of normalcy in our small town. However, the memory of Jesse's untimely demise and the sinister presence of Neani lingered in the back of our minds. Pete and I immersed ourselves in Cheyenne traditions and lore hoping to equip ourselves with knowledge that might protect us from the soul stalker. We connected with elders in our community, seeking their wisdom and guidance in understanding this ancient legend. They told us of powerful rituals and talismans that could ward off malicious spirits like Neani. Determined not to succumb to the same fate as our dear friend, we embarked on a journey to learn more about these ancient practices. Through years of practice and dedication, Pete became well-versed in traditional rituals, while I focused on finding rare amulets and talismans that held spiritual significance to our native culture. We learned everything we could about the Soul Stalker, his motives, his weaknesses, and the methods used by Cheyenne ancestors to keep him at bay. It became evident that Neani's ultimate goal was not only to prey on the souls of the living but to gain control over entire communities through fear. Together, Pete and I resolved to protect those we cared about by sharing our newfound knowledge within our community. Slowly but surely, people began incorporating the traditional practices we taught into their daily lives. Houses displayed protective symbols at their entrances. Whispered prayers within sacred circles became commonplace during nighttime gatherings, and a renewed sense of unity blossomed. Despite our efforts, Neani's lurking presence was never entirely forgotten, like an unspoken dread lying dormant just beneath the surface of everyday life. But as our community grew stronger and more spiritually resilient together, we discovered a newfound peace rooted in the belief that we had the power to face down whatever shadows hid behind dark corners. Yet no matter how much assurance our vigilance against the Soul Stalker brought us, we knew that this wasn't a battle to be won once and for all. Rather, it was an ongoing struggle, one that would demand our constant vigilance and adaptability in the face of changing times. For as long as we remained vigilant, our loved ones would remain safe from the insidious predations of Neani, the soul stalker. I was never much of a believer in the supernatural. But after what I went through, I'll never look at the world the same way again. It all started when my buddies and I rented a cabin for a long weekend in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. My name is Denali Bearcloud, born and raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and honestly, 
All I expected from this trip was a break from the everyday grind. The cabin was surprisingly nice for being so far off the beaten path. It belonged to one of my friend's cousins, who left the keys in our care. We quickly settled in and decided to explore some trails nearby that my friend Jonah knew about. The odd sounds began as we were hiking through the dense forest. At first, it seemed like any other day out in nature, hearing branches snap and leaves rustle underfoot. We were about two hours into our hike when things took an eerie turn. In the distance, we heard shrill cries echoing through the woods. My buddy Nikasun glanced at me with unease etched on his face. Hey Denali, do you know what kind of animal makes that sound? He asked nervously. No clue, I replied honestly. But let's keep moving. It could be some mischievous campers or something. By late afternoon, we made our way back to the cabin without any further incidents. We decided to build a fire out back and enjoy a few cold beers while grilling dinner. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across our campsite. Suddenly there was a loud thud behind us, and we all turned on alert. Nikasun's twin sister Annika caught sight of it first, something enormous hurling towards us through the twilight. Run! She screamed as we scrambled for cover. Whatever it was, it went straight for Jonah first and mangled him so badly that we could hardly recognize him. The thing seemed part beast, part nightmare, with massive predatory eyes, gnarled limbs, and a malicious grin. After the brutal attack, it vanished into the darkness again. We were all petrified, whispering urgently about what to do next. Nikki knew more about the local lore than any of us and recalled her grandmother mentioning a mysterious creature called Skawatko. It was said to be an ancient and malevolent being that devoured anyone who unknowingly wandered into its territory. We were out of our depth, but we had to get out of there alive. We planned our escape to the closest town in complete darkness, only using the faint moonlight as our guide. Nikasun suggested taking turns watching for danger while navigating the treacherous terrain. As we made our way through the woods, suspense gripped us as we saw shadows flitting past in our peripheral vision. We tried desperately to keep steady breaths and whispered reassurances to each other, knowing full well that panicking would not do us any good. The tension became unbearable when Annika let out a choking sob her gaze locked on a grisly sight ahead. We slowly approached two mutilated bodies, both of which bore marks eerily similar to Jonah's wounds. Could this mean that Skawatko had struck before? And if yes, then how long had it been hunting people in these woods? It was while we were burying the remains that another thought struck me. Why wasn't Skawatko attacking us right now? Was it enjoying our fear and vulnerability first? It could have killed us many times over by this point. Our morbid burial was finally complete when Annika gasped in horror from her spot in the Earth's circle they used for mapping their location as per her mom's advice before venturing on trips like these. She found their names written with something dark and viscous on a rock. The realization sank in that these bodies belonged to another group that stayed at the cabin just a week ago. Just how many lost souls were devoured by Skawatko? How many never left these woods to tell the tale? Fearful but resolved, we pushed forward, leaving the gruesome scene behind. Overshadowed by the dire situation, we had no choice but to forge ahead and pray the creature didn't return. As dawn broke, so did our hope that we would see our loved ones again. We staggered into town as a shell-shocked group of survivors. Back at our homes, as we recounted our terrifying ordeal, no one seemed to believe us. Our families and friends dismissed our story as a macabre joke or the result of wild imaginations fueled by late-night tales around the campfire. But we knew the truth, that something sinister, malevolent, 
and unimaginable resided in those woods. We felt that it was our duty to warn others about the lurking danger. Despite being ridiculed and ostracized, we resolved to put up posters and report what happened to the local authorities. The reaction from law enforcement was muted. They likely assumed we'd come across a bear or perhaps an act of violence we couldn't comprehend. They promised to investigate but warned us against stirring panic in the community. Our trauma ran deep, and we were left with personal demons to exorcise. Years went by, and while some of us eventually moved away or lost touch with one another, thoughts of Skawatko still haunted each one of us. As time went on, whispers about its existence ended up making the rounds once again and people who ventured to those remote parts of the Cascade Mountains continued to go missing without a trace. It was as if Skawatko remained hungry for more victims. This shared experience bonded us in ways that we would never have expected but left an indelible mark on our psyche, a dark reminder that nightmares can sometimes leap out from beyond the veil of myths and legends into reality, claiming even those who never believed they could exist. And so our lives were forever changed because fate had entangled us in a battle against an ancient evil we had no way of understanding or escaping entirely. All that was left for us is the haunting legacy of Skowatko, an unspeakable terror that lurks in shadows unseen by most but will forever color our perception of what lies just beyond the boundary where the natural and supernatural worlds collide. It was a Saturday night like any other in August of 2014. I was at my cousin Kaysen's house, playing video games and joking around. One thing to mention, I'm a Cheyenne Native American, born and raised in Wyoming. Kaysen and I thought we'd make the most of the summer by cooling off near the lake in Bridger Teton National Forest. Little did we know that our innocent lake trip would turn into a horrifying ordeal. It all began so casually. We grabbed our camping gear, hopped in my beat-up truck, and made our way to one of our favorite spots, a hidden lakeside beach surrounded by dense woodland. The idyllic atmosphere gave us no reason to suspect anything sinister lurking beneath the tranquil surface. We spent the day swimming, fishing, and hanging out with some fellow campers who'd set up their tents nearby. The group engaged in light-hearted banter as we exchanged travel stories and shared drinks. It wasn't until much later that evening, when darkness fell, that things took a chilling turn. As we gathered around the bonfire to roast marshmallows, one of the campers we'd befriended earlier took out his phone to record the candid moments of laughter. But while reviewing his footage, he noticed something peculiar a figure lurking in the shadows just beyond our campsite. I tried to shake off any trepidation by reminding myself that it could be nothing more than another camper or perhaps an animal passing through. However, I couldn't entirely ignore the nagging fear creeping up my spine as we continued chatting late into the night. In retrospect, I should have taken more notice at that point but instead chose to dismiss my anxiety as unwarranted paranoia. My cousin sensed something was off too but assumed I was overreacting. As time went by, we focused on enjoying ourselves until every camper finally retreated to their respective tents, leaving Kaysen and me to unwind in front of the dwindling firelight. Suddenly, we heard rustling in the bushes, followed by heavy thuds. My heart raced, and without thinking, I grabbed a flashlight and pointed it towards the commotion. There, only meters away, was an enormous creature with antler-like horns and bloodshot eyes, something that I'd never even come across in any Native American folklore. Panic gripped us as we stumbled back into the safety of our tent, praying for the creature to leave us alone. But instead of leaving us alone, 
Its terrifying growls grew louder and more aggressive as it began circling our campsite. Fear-stricken, we decided against making a run for it, knowing that our chances against such a monstrous being were slim. We did our best to stay silent and endure the night while listening to the beast's every move. Hours crawled by when suddenly we heard gut-wrenching screams from the neighboring campers, an ominous confirmation of their grisly fate at the hands of this relentless menace. At first light, we cautiously emerged from our shelter, horrified by the carnage that lay before us. Blood stained the ground, tattered tents surrounded our campsite, and there wasn't a single soul left except for my cousin and me. We rushed back through the woods to civilization, and people from the nearby town listened in disbelief as we recounted our harrowing tale. That's when an elder from my tribe shared with us stories of their encounters with a fabled creature named Gistoniac Sivodier, one that had plagued their community long ago with equal parts terror and mystery. In retrospect, maybe it wasn't wise to dismiss my instincts so quickly. Our lives were forever changed by that fateful summer night spent near Bridger Teton National Forest. Although my cousin and I survived and still don't know the true origin of that nightmarish creature, I will never forget the haunting gaze of Gistoniac Sivodier and the terror it brought upon us all. In the years that followed, Kaysen and I became consumed by the need to unravel the enigma that was Gistoniac Sivodier. We spent countless hours poring over tribal histories, legends, and folklore in search of any clues that might shed light on this elusive nocturnal terror. Our relentless pursuit of knowledge brought us not only closer to the mysteries of our tribal heritage, but also took us on a journey through the unexplored wilderness of our own fears and misconceptions. The trauma we had endured left us with scars and uneasy memories but it simultaneously forged a bond between my cousin and me that no ordinary life experience could ever replicate. During one of our investigations, we came across a remote village where several elders claimed to have encountered Gistoniac Sivodier themselves or knew someone who had. These ancient tales described the creature not merely as a mindless predator but also as a harbinger of change an apex entity that rose from the shadows when the balance between man and nature was in peril. It was believed that its presence signified an impending cataclysm or some form of significant upheaval within the tribe. This revelation took us down a path we never expected. We realized that instead of focusing solely on fear, we should also consider what these encounters meant in terms of our own personal growth and the fate of our people. We couldn't undo the past, but we could learn from it and perhaps find a way to prevent future tragedies by understanding the greater message behind Gistoniac Sivodies manifestations. And so, our odyssey continued, as diligently as before, but with a newfound perspective, one rooted less in dread and more in reverence for the balance between darkness and light, chaos and order, fear and courage. Every story held powerful lessons about survival, resilience, and above all, the indomitable human spirit. It started on a normal day, or as normal as it could be. I, Maverick Tall Sky, was hanging out with my buddies at the local diner in our small and unassuming town in Nevada. We were just shooting the breeze, making fun of each other's poker skills, and discussing our latest misadventures. I remember that day we were laughing at how Grayson couldn't even handle a single shot of whiskey during last night's party. As the laughter died down, I realized it was time for work. I said my goodbyes and left for my shift at the nearby mine. Most people here knew each other, considering it wasn't a big town. We often joked that everyone had been here for so long that we were starting to look like each other. That's why it was weird when, on my drive to work, 
I noticed an odd figure standing on the outskirts of the forest. From a distance, it looked almost like a tall man obscured by shadows with piercing eyes that seemed illuminated. Later on, when I swapped stories with Danny and Phil over coffee in our break room, I discovered they'd also seen strange figures lurking around the town. We shook it off as just an odd coincidence, assuming that maybe some forest animals or perhaps urban explorers had wandered through. At this point in time, none of us felt uneasy or anticipated what lay ahead of us. Days passed without any major incidents. Life continued as usual. Mining shifts ran without disturbance and card games carried on late into the night. Matters took a dark turn one evening when Carlos, one of our fellow miners, didn't show up for his shift. He wasn't known for simply skipping work, he always took his job seriously. After voicing our concerns about his disappearance to Sheriff Jackson, he informed us he'd gotten multiple missing person reports throughout the week but had been keeping them low-key so as not to cause panic. This sent chills down our spines. As the town assembled to search for clues, it became apparent that something wasn't right. In the woods, we came across the limbs of various animals strewn about in a gut-wrenching manner. Their remains were torn apart, making it evident that whatever was responsible wasn't a regular animal. Word of our gruesome discoveries spread and whispers of the Paiute legend Skinwalker started to surface. You see, this creature could disguise itself as anything, not just animals, but humans too. The thought that this pitted might be responsible for the missing townsfolk fueled intense paranoia among us. Serial disappearances and gruesome incidents continued. My town became enveloped in shadow and fear. Late one evening, we collapsed under the suffocating atmosphere during what was supposed to be a light-hearted poker game at Danny's place. Phil was walking home when he heard distorted howls and choked cries from parts unknown. Fearing for his life, Phil darted into the bushes by the side of the road. Suddenly, just mere yards away from him, stood an enormous coyote-like monster with antlers sprouting from its head like branches of some vile tree. The creature seemed to sense his presence and turned its head slowly in Phil's direction, causing him to hold his breath. He noticed its eyes were unsettlingly human but infected by malice and violence beyond comprehension. Our friend made a narrow escape that night by waiting for the beast to lose interest in his hiding spot. He sprinted back to Danny's house, where we listened to his shaken account. There was no mistaking it now. We faced an evil that was out of this world. The reign of terror went on until Eliza Strongbow, the granddaughter of an elder who'd studied our tribe's occult history, returned to town. A few days after her arrival, she recounted stories her grandfather had passed down of a being known only as the Riven One. The creature's true motive remained unclear, but according to the legends, it left behind a trail of mystery, bloodshed, and tragedy. Whatever this entity was, it continued to haunt us until one fateful day, when Sheriff Jackson took matters into his own hands. He gathered some townsfolk and waited for sundown to confront the abomination. In a chaotic showdown, which we heard from miles away, bullets finally hit their mark. Miraculously, our nightmare seemed to come to an end. However, in the aftermath of that harrowing night, I sometimes could not help but wonder if we had truly vanquished the terror that plagued our small town. The unexplained disappearances and grisly discoveries ceased, allowing a semblance of normality to return. We eventually resumed our card games at the local diner, but the conversations were never quite the same. Lingering questions and chilling thoughts persisted, leaving us constantly looking over our shoulders, haunted by the ordeal that we had faced. As time passed, some families moved away from our once peaceful community in search of safer pastures, their faith in our town's safety all but shattered. 
Although no one had seen anything resembling the skinwalker since Sheriff Jackson's confrontation, everyone remained on edge. Eliza Strongbow went on to serve as a repository of knowledge for those who sought answers on matters beyond the scope of everyday life in Nevada. In a town where everyone knew each other and shared centuries of history, we couldn't help but suspect anything slightly unusual. Whenever someone was late for work or missed an appointment, our thoughts raced back to that frightening period when loved ones vanished without a trace. We couldn't help but speculate whether the Riven One had truly met its end or simply vanished into the shadows to bide its time. Regardless of what became of that sinister creature, it forever changed our small Nevada town. We now bore an unspoken burden, a dark secret that bound us together and made us hesitant to speak of those dreadful events, a feeling that would forever lurk just beneath the surface of our everyday lives. I still remember that night as clearly as if it were just yesterday. It was a Tuesday, October 17th, and I was driving back from Cheyenne to my home in Laramie. I had been visiting some old friends, and the drive wasn't too long, so I found myself humming along to some classic rock on the radio. My name's Aiden Wayskuck. I'm a Cheyenne native working as a park ranger in nearby Medicine Bow National Forest. I'd heard the rumors of strange occurrences in these woods over the years, but always dismissed them as tall tales. That is, until that night. The stretch of road cutting through the forest has always given me this uneasy feeling. There was something almost claustrophobic about the dense trees surrounding it. The forest seemed to swallow each source of artificial light like a black hole engulfing matter. As I drove on, all alone with no other cars around, I couldn't help but notice how quiet it was outside my vehicle. A sudden jolt from my car brought me back to reality. What just happened? It felt like I'd hit something pretty heavy out there on the road. With a sigh, I put the car in park and reluctantly stepped out to investigate. Lying in the middle of the road was a massive elk, or at least what was left of it. The poor creature's remains were mangled beyond recognition. It looked like a scene straight out of a nightmare. Its ribcage had been torn open mercilessly, and blood and viscera spread out around it like warped paint on canvas. What the hell did this? I muttered under my breath, feeling nauseous and terrified all at once. At that moment, Reagan, a fellow park ranger, appeared seemingly out of nowhere from behind some trees. His eyes widened when he saw the carcass before him. Looks like we got us a Grendel, he said, trying to laugh it off, but his voice wavered. Grendel is an old native legend from my people. A creature that was said to stalk the woods, feasting on humans and animals alike. It had been a mere bedtime story for me growing up. But standing there with the gruesome evidence right in front of me, I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that there might be some truth to it. Over the next few days, more mutilated bodies of animals were found in the forest. Fear began to spread through the community like wildfire. What had once been met with skepticism now hangs in the air like a toxic cloud. Reports started coming in of a large, shadowy creature stalking local trails around dusk. People were terrified to venture out after the sun went down. Reagan and I decided we needed to do some investigating ourselves. Late one evening, we set off with our flashlights into the darkness of the woods. The sinister atmosphere seemed to tighten around us as we trekked further into the unknown. We stumbled across another grisly scene, a deer torn apart brutally, or rather, what little remained of it. Suddenly, we heard a sound that one could only describe as bestial, part growl, part cackle, echoing through the trees like a chilling siren call. 
Reagan and I shared nervous glances before pressing on cautiously. As we rounded a corner near River Goddard's old cabin, now long abandoned due to eerie incidents driving away its inhabitants years ago, our flashlights revealed another gruesome display. Human remains strewn about in a macabre artwork of gore and bygone life. This can't be real, Reagan whispered, trembling almost imperceptibly. Backing away slowly from the horrific sight before us, we resolved that whatever was happening in these woods had to be stopped. We spent weeks combing every inch of the forest and interviewing local residents for any piece of information that might help us track down this monster. Finally, after yet another sleepless night of searching and endless questioning, we stumbled upon the horrifying truth. Old man Clarence Ramsdell, a lumberyard worker, had a string of unusual behaviors that aligned with every time the Grendel struck. It turns out he was the embodiment of the terrifying folktale, becoming possessed by the creature and committing these unspeakable acts. My heart ached as I realized, even then, that the legend I'd grown up hearing was no myth at all. And though Grendel's reign of terror had been quenched, the nightmare it had awakened in our community would forever cast a shadow over the once peaceful woods of Medicine Bound National Forest. The trauma left behind was palpable, and as we gathered to mourn the lives lost, we couldn't help but feel uneasy, even knowing that Grendel's human host had been apprehended. The healing process was slow for our tight-knit community. Neighbors leaned on one another, sharing stories of loved ones who had fallen victim to the malevolent entity. A memorial was established in the forest, a simple wooden cross adorned with flowers and tokens of remembrance, honoring all those who had perished during this dark chapter in our town's history. Though the harrowing Grendel had been subdued and Clarence imprisoned, its spectral presence seemed to loom over us. As park rangers, Reagan and I pledged to keep a closer eye on the eerie woods where such a tragedy had unfolded. We also found solace in educating others about our shared ordeal and working with local authorities and spiritual leaders to dispel rumors and combat fear through education and understanding. We didn't want a repeat of these horrifying events. No one should ever again experience what we'd faced. Years have passed since that terrifying time when Grendel's malevolent might plague our town. The scars remain etched into both the landscape and our hearts, but we have learned to live with them. Medicine Bound National Forest still stands tall as a beautiful reminder of nature's power, beloved by locals and visitors alike, but it carries within it a darkness that can never truly be forgotten. Some nights, when I drive past that same stretch of road where it all began, I can't help but shudder at the memories that echo through my mind. My name is Aiden Wayscock. I'm no longer just a park ranger engulfed by my routine work in these woods. I'm also a guardian of the land and its secrets, ensuring that the legend of Grendel remains a solemn lesson to others who may become entangled in its sinister web. It all started on a normal day, or at least I thought it was. I had just finished my routine morning jog around the outskirts of our small town, which has thick forests surrounding it. My name is Jackson Wipier, a 34-year-old Cheyenne American native with a steady job as an accountant. Life was ordinary back then, which is something I desperately wish I could go back to. I had invited my closest friends to a barbecue at my house that night, thinking it was going to be the usual fun and laughter we always shared together. The sun began to set, painting the sky with vibrant hues as everyone started to munch on their food and enjoy each other's company. Michael Reese, one of my oldest friends, brought up the recent spate of mutilated animal carcasses found in the area which caused an uneasy silence among us. 
As we moved the party indoors, the conversation took an even darker turn when Jenny Harrison mentioned her cousin, who'd recently disappeared in these parts. Not wanting to further dampen the mood, we quickly changed the subject. None of us would have ever imagined that just hours later, we too would be face to face with something so unspeakably terrifying. Later that night, after everyone had left, I was cleaning up around the yard when I heard something in the bushes nearby. Coaxed by curiosity and not sensing any imminent danger, I went to investigate. It wasn't unusual for a raccoon or some other small critter to make its way onto my property, but this time it was different. As soon as I stepped closer to the edge of the forested area behind my house, a vile stench hit me like a ton of bricks. At first, I thought it must have been another unfortunate animal carcass rotting nearby, but something in my gut insisted that this was different, more sinister. My mind raced as I considered whether there could be any connection to the dark topic of conversation that came up earlier in the evening, but I brushed it off as mere coincidence. Why would anything bad happen to me? I traced the origin of the smell, and that's when I found it. A lifeless deer, torn apart, with its innards strewn haphazardly on the ground nearby. The brutality of the scene made my stomach churn. Something had torn this creature apart with an unnatural savagery. Terrified by this gruesome discovery, I rushed back to my house and locked every door and window I could find. My heart pounded in my ears as I tried to rationalize what I had witnessed. Hours seemed like minutes as fear stole the passage of time. As morning finally broke, I decided that enough was enough. I had to tell someone. Michael was the first person who came to mind. He'd always been skeptical about such things but was intrigued by my account. We agreed to bring this up to Sheriff Titan, who, though initially dismissive, decided to investigate further based on our insistence. What we found was worse than we ever imagined. Over the next few weeks, mutilated carcasses continued to appear around town, each more grotesque than the last, yet no one saw or heard anything. The town was on edge. Nobody felt safe anymore. Parents kept their children close by while grown men traveled in groups after dark. Yet despite our diligent efforts, we couldn't seem to pinpoint the monster that brought this lingering dread over us all. Its true nature remained a haunting enigma. As desperation mounted among us all, we consulted a local Cheyenne elder who specialized in folklore and native legends. Though we were highly skeptical that our antagonist was anything other than just a twisted individual or animal on a rampage, there were few stones left unturned. The elders spoke of an ancient story known among their people, something few, if any, others knew about, about a malevolent creature unique to our land, referred to as the Istasaya. Its name alone sent a chill down our spines. It was said to be a relentless hunter with insatiable bloodlust, almost immortal. The carnage that surrounded us seemed to align with what the Istasaya was capable of, but still, we wanted solid proof. These were dark days for our town, and yet for all the fear and uncertainty that gripped us, we remained united against the faceless terror that hunted us. The true crime that had been thrust upon us created an intense bond between neighbors. We knew that our only hope of making it through this nightmare was to rely on one another, trust in our strength as a community and refused to succumb to the paralyzing fear. Under the guidance of the Cheyenne Elder, we began researching anything and everything we could on the Istasaya, desperate for a way to end its reign of terror. Through ancient texts and forgotten tales, we started to piece together clues that might lead us to some sort of resolution or protection from the creature. One night, after hours of poring over dusty volumes in the town library with Michael and the Elder, we came across an obscure passage that described a ritual capable of driving away the monstrous being. Although there were no guarantees that it would work, 
we decided it was worth a try. Anything that could potentially save our town and our lives was worth pursuing. With renewed determination, we presented our findings to Sheriff Tyden and pleaded with him to let us perform the ritual. Though reluctant at first, he finally agreed under the condition that he would oversee the process, ensuring that no harm would come to any of his townspeople. As we prepared for the ritual deep in the heart of the forest, a strange quietness enveloped us. It was as if nature itself held its breath in anticipation of what was about to transpire. In retrospect, I cannot help but ask myself whether this was simply my imagination's influence on memory or something more, something beyond understanding, because truthfully, we were all affected by forces not entirely from this world during these days, from Sheriff Titan down to every last one of us. The ceremony began under a moonless sky, just as described in those old texts, our hearts pounding but ready for whatever may come next. It all started on August 12, 2015, in a small town just outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming. My name's Kester Blackwood. An unusual name, I know, but that's the least of my concerns right now. At around 2 p.m. that day, I was hanging out with my friends at the local diner. We were passing the time by sharing work stories and occasionally poking fun at each other over a few beers. Suddenly, my buddy Easton slammed his beer down on the table and gestured towards the window. Hey Kest, have you heard about those strange attacks happening around here lately? I raised an eyebrow and shook my head. No, I haven't. What kind of attacks? As he started to fill me in on the details, I felt a shiver run down my spine. Over the next couple of weeks, bizarre incidents began to pile up. Livestock had been found mutilated and several people had reported hearing strange noises in the night, bone-chilling shrieks and growls that they couldn't identify. Still, none of us wanted to believe what was going on. After all, this was our home we were talking about. Then one evening, as I was coming home from work, I found myself caught up in the chaos with absolutely no warning. The sun was setting behind me as I walked along a desolate stretch of road, surrounded by dense forests on either side. Without any sound or indication, something charged at me from the shadows, something massive. Its speed was somehow both graceful and disturbingly unnatural. In a moment of adrenaline-fueled instinct, I dove to the side and felt its claws just barely graze my arm as it rushed past me. Breathing heavily and struggling to regain my bearings, I glanced back and caught a glimpse of what looked like antlers sprouting from a deer-like creature, but this was no ordinary deer. Its eyes were an eerie red, and its entire frame was twisted beyond reason. I sprinted back to town and burst through the front door of my house. My friends had gathered there that night, and as I collapsed into a chair, I told them what had happened. Gazes of disbelief quickly turned into solemn acknowledgement. After searching for any local stories about such bizarre encounters, we stumbled upon the legend of the Baishin, a malevolent creature that was not quite human or animal. It would stalk and hunt those who crossed its path with vicious intent. The more we researched, the more everything seemed to connect. We spoke to law enforcement only to be met with skepticism. Nobody wanted to believe in supernatural creatures. Determined to uncover the truth ourselves, we spent our nights patrolling the forests and fields surrounding our town, desperate to find any shred of evidence that could confirm our suspicions or put them to rest. One fateful night, as we made our way through a particularly dark and isolated area, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from behind us. Turning around, we saw Easton being dragged away, 
his arms sprawled out, reaching for help. Easton! We charged towards the creature, using everything within our power to fight it off. In that moment of terror and adrenaline, something within us shifted. We had been victims long enough. The beast was caught off guard as one of us managed to land a heavy blow on its head. The creature howled in pain and retreated into the shadows. We weren't sure if it was dead or just injured. All we knew was that it disappeared from sight without a trace. The vulnerability we felt before its attack turned into passion for fighting against this unknown terror. We helped Easton get back to his feet and carried him back home. Months later, in a conversation with an off-duty police officer, we learned the monster plaguing our town had been reported by other communities in our state under the name Baishin. Our encounter wasn't unique, and the creature remained a dark and terrifying mystery. In the years that followed, our small group of survivors became known as the Baishin Hunters. Word of our encounter with the creature spread throughout Wyoming and beyond and soon we were contacted by others who had faced similar horrors. They sought our help and expertise, looking for a way to protect their own communities from this dark and elusive threat. Although our lives had been forever changed by that fateful night in the woods, we became more than just victims. We became warriors. Each one of us learned to use various weapons and trained tirelessly in hand-to-hand -hand combat determined to not only protect our homes, but also those who lived in fear of the Baishin. As our reputation grew, we found ourselves working alongside experts in folklore, weaponry, and even paranormal investigations. We continued to dig deeper into the creature's origins and discovered it was part of a larger, complex mythology that spanned across cultures and nations. Through it all, we became family bound together by shared trauma and a common goal, to rid the world of this malevolent being once and for all. Despite our best efforts, however, sightings of the Baishin continued to haunt towns across Wyoming for years. Even though we always responded to distress calls without hesitation, we couldn't help but wonder if we would ever truly succeed in eliminating this seemingly indestructible force. Yet still, we pressed on, fighting relentlessly against the darkness that threatened so many innocent lives, driven by hope that one day our brotherhood would stand victorious over the monster that transformed us from everyday citizens into the unfaltering Baishin hunters. I never thought my annual camping trip would turn into a living nightmare. It was the summer of 2017, and I packed up my truck and hit the road, heading for the Appalachian Mountains. Me and some friends always enjoyed spending a week or more every year reconnecting with nature. Little did we know that we'd encounter something that would change our lives forever. My name is Kayla Little Bear. I'm a Cheyenne native, and I've lived in the foothills of these mountains all my life. For generations, my people have respected and revered the land, its beauty and its beasts. But soon we'd learn that there was at least one creature around here that struck fear into even the locals. The first night out in the wilderness was like any other. I pitched my tent, hung up our food to keep away bears and built a campfire with the guys. We drank beer, swapped stories, and eventually dozed off under the stars. It wasn't until the following evening that things started to unravel. We stumbled upon an old campsite, a place that looked like it had seen some serious action. Torn tents lay scattered among smashed cans of food and empty beer bottles. It was eerie, but we didn't think much of it, it seemed logical that some careless hikers had partied too hard out here before us. That night, though, as we were playing cards by the firelight, we heard an unusual noise resonate from just beyond the tree lean, 
a cross between a growl and a guttural screech that sent shivers down our spines. As the days went by, the unsettling noises continued echoing around us, always staying at a distance. It reached a breaking point when one morning we found large claw marks etched into tree trunks around our site. It felt like something was stalking us. We questioned whether to cut our trip short but decided instead to investigate further, believing it to be a wild animal that we could potentially scare off. We found strange footprints leading deeper into the woods and decided to follow them. What we didn't expect was to find an abandoned cabin in the depths of the forest. Its windows shattered, claw marks covering the door, and blood splatters staining its floorboards. We started putting the pieces together, thinking that perhaps some monstrous creature was responsible for what happened at the campsite we stumbled upon, and maybe even more. Now fearing for our lives, we hastily returned to our camp in hopes of packing up and leaving as soon as possible. But on arriving back, it hit us, a realization that we were being hunted by something truly sinister. It was Joe's scream that first alerted us. The poor guy had been impaled through the chest by sharp, elongated claws. Something had attacked him while he packed up his gear. As we stood there in horror, a massive shadow emerged from behind our mutilated friend. Standing on two legs but resembling nothing human was a beast shrouded in mythology, a creature of Native American legend named Skookum, known for its terrifying strength and relentless bloodlust. We were its prey now, and we knew escape was unlikely. With no other option, we fought until our last breath using whatever tools or makeshift weapons were available. It was a battle that seemed nearly impossible to win. After losing two more friends during the chaotic altercation, Eddie managed to land a painful blow on Skookum's head with a sharpened stick. The creature shrieked in pain before retreating back into the forest. We didn't waste any time fleeing back to civilization. We were bruised, battered, and broken-hearted over our lost friends. When I finally made it home and recounted my harrowing experience to my family, their faces turned pale as they listened. They told me old stories about Skookum that echoed my own horrifying encounter. It's been years since that fateful trip, and I've yet to go back into the Appalachians. The trauma of that nightmare still lingers with me to this day. The once tranquil mountains, which held such beauty and serenity, now only serve as a menacing reminder of the horrors we faced. I've dedicated my life since then to researching and understanding more about Skookum, the creature that robbed me of my friends and forever changed the way I view the wilderness surrounding my home. As I've delved into the legends and historical accounts of past encounters, it's become clear that our experience was not an isolated incident. Over the years, several other explorers and camping groups have mysteriously vanished or suffered terrible fates within those very mountains, their stories echoing the nightmare we endured. As time passes, the scar on my soul does not heal. Instead, it drives me to uncover the mystery of that fiendish creature and find a way to end its existence so no one else has to suffer in its wake. It was a typical Friday evening at the bar, the kind where you can almost taste the anticipation in the air. Sitting back with my buddies, I downed another beer, laughing at the nonsense that we spun into stories. My name is Talis Lonewolf, and this was our usual weekend routine in our small town in Wyoming. We were far enough from the city for it to be peaceful, but close enough to not feel isolated. I swear, man, if I hear one more story about that damn monster lurking in the darkness, I'm going to puke, groaned Ben, always dismissive of anything remotely unnatural. Ben was a rough and tumble dude who didn't believe in anything he couldn't see or touch. 
We continued talking as the evening wore on and finally decided to call it a night. As the group split up and went their separate ways, I got into my pickup truck and headed towards home. The drive was routine. I'd been driving this route for years. As I drove along the winding road leading up to my house at the edge of town, something caught my eye. A dark shape seemed to glide past my headlights, looking like a disfigured deer but much larger. My pulse quickened for a moment, but in an instant it was gone. I parked the truck and rushed inside, trying to brush off what I'd just seen as my imagination playing tricks on me. As I changed out of my clothes and got ready for bed, sleep descended on me like a heavy cloak. That night, I had vivid nightmares about something stalking me. But sleep eventually claimed me until morning broke. I could have sworn it was just a nightmare caused by too many beers and Ben's comment about the monster earlier that night. But then the news came. Kevin Larrick, another friend from our group, had gone missing sometime during the night after leaving our get-together. His car was found abandoned not far from my house, doors flung wide open, as if he'd raced away from the car to escape something. Initially, no one knew how to react. Casual conversations turned into whispers behind closed doors. My pulse raced as I remembered the bizarre encounter on the drive home the night before. Had I somehow stumbled upon a secret? The town soon united in a search to find Kevin, families, friends, and even law enforcement joined in our efforts to track him down. I'll never forget the moment we found him, or what was left of him. What drove fear into the hearts of everyone present was the state of Kevin's body. There wasn't much left. But what remained was so gruesome that even the toughest residents could barely hold their composure. It looked like he'd been mauled by something far worse than any wild animal we'd ever seen. I shuddered at the image of his remains, etched forever in my memory. As we investigated around Kevin's body, Kira O'Sullivan, a veteran tracker in our community, discovered unusual footprints scattered nearby. They looked like long claw marks that didn't match any predator native to our area. Chills ran down my spine. Those prints brought back thoughts of my late night encounter on that winding Wyoming road. Overwhelmed by grief and curiosity all at once, I took it upon myself to research old records and texts about local lore and strange incidents from years past. Days later, I stumbled upon a story that mentioned an ancient Native American creature that has haunted our region for centuries. The creature was called Sioka, a horrifying being derived from Native American folklore with an insatiable hunger for flesh and blood. Sioka, I whispered out loud, horrified by what this revelation might mean for our town. What if Kevin's death wasn't an isolated event? How had something so terrifying survived beneath our modern world's surface, undetected and preying upon us? And what role had our town played in its monstrous existence? The answers remained hidden, lurking somewhere in the shadows. The town was never the same after Kevin's brutal death. Life continued, but with a darker edge with suspicion clouding everyone's minds as they feared who or what the monster might target next. Even I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling every time my headlights crossed that winding road, knowing that Sayoka was out there and that it may be lurking closer than I ever imagined. I became obsessed with finding more information about the Sayoka and tried to dig deeper into the town's history. I frequented old libraries and interviewed elderly residents who had lived in the area for decades. My quest turned up chilling anecdotes and fragmented accounts that were eerily similar to Kevin's fate. People were starting to regard me with wary eyes as I put together the pieces of a story that was never meant to be unearthed. The few brave souls who believed me realized we had no choice but to confront this ancient evil. We formed a secretive coalition, 
determined to track down the Sioka and put an end to its bloody reign. Late night expeditions searching for clues became routine, gradually transforming us from peaceful town dwellers into relentless hunters. Our group grew, forging bonds of trust that only those who face darkness together could understand. But as we chased shadows, the creature continued its merciless slaughter, and our desperation grew. Fractures began to form among us. Friends turned against each other as accusations flew, blaming those closest for failing to prevent each violent death. The weight of what we were up against clawed at my insides, but I knew I couldn't give up, no matter the cost. Our once close-knit community was now plagued by relentless fear, and all I had left was my devotion to unmasking this terrifying force hidden within our midst. Yet even as I confronted the gruesome details that stained our town's legacy, deep down I wondered if we would ever truly be free of the Sioka's grasp, or if its hold over us was destined to last forever. I never thought I'd be one to share a story like this, but it's something that has haunted me for years, and I feel like I can't bottle it up any longer. My name is Akachita Iron Horse, and back in the summer of 2004, I was living in a quiet town near the Cheyenne Reservation in Wyoming. That summer started out like any other. I was working at my uncle's horse ranch, hanging out with friends doing all the usual things. It wasn't until about a month into summer vacation that things took a turn for the worse. My buddies, Koana and Chaska, and I had been heading to a bar just off the reservation after work one Friday. We were laughing and joking around, sharing stories from our days on the ranch, when Chaska brought up this bizarre animal he had seen lurking behind some bushes earlier that day. He couldn't quite explain it because of its unsettling appearance. Dude, it was just weird, Chaska stammered. Like something ancient mixed with a freaking nightmare. We figured he probably had one too many beers during his lunch break. But even as we laughed it off at the time, that memory stuck with me. A week later, I received a phone call from Koena in the middle of the night. His voice was shaky and frantic as he told me something had attacked his cattle. When I arrived at his farm, there were clear signs of violence. One cow lay lifeless on the ground with deep gashes across its body as if carved by a ruthless predator. What could have done this? Koana asked, panic evident in his voice. I didn't have an answer for him. In all our years on the ranches around here, We'd seen our share of coyote attacks and other predators, but nothing like this. As days passed by without further incident, rumors began to circulate around town. Locals whispered about a creature few believed existed, a remnant of our folklore, the Chinikara, a powerful and fearsome spirit known to stalk and torment its victims. Initially, I was skeptical. It seemed like the kind of story parents tell their kids to make them behave. That all changed one evening when I was driving home alone after a long day at work. It was getting dark, but as I made my way down an isolated stretch of road, something caught my eye in the rearview mirror. The creature Chaska had described weeks ago emerged from the thickets on the side of the road, stalking the empty asphalt. Its movements were hauntingly deliberate, and something about its eyes seemed to know what it was doing. My heart raced as fear washed over me. Suddenly, it leaped onto my truck's tailgate with an ear-piercing shriek. Without thinking, I floored the gas pedal, desperate to put distance between myself and the creature. It clung on for dear life as I swerved and accelerated. And while my fight-or-flight instincts screamed at me to keep going, I glanced into the rearview mirror again, only to catch sight of its twisted grin before it vanished into the darkness. 
terrified, shaken, and not knowing who'd believe me or what we'd find, I decided with my friends that we needed professional help. We couldn't allow this creature to evade us any longer or bring harm to anyone else. It took some time and perseverance, but we'd stumbled upon Dr. Theana Barnaby Stonecrow, an expert on Native American folklore and mythology who happened to be in Wyoming on a lecture tour. When we told her our story over the phone, she agreed to meet us right away. After meticulously taking notes during our conversation with her at a local diner and reluctant expressions over several rounds of coffee, she said, Akachita, Koana, and Chaska, what you've witnessed is indeed the Chenikara. It's a spirit that has roamed these lands for centuries, a merciless predator with unimaginable strength and agility. Whatever its motive may be for attacking your town, I assure you that it will not easily be driven away. Sitting across from her in a crowded diner for the first time throughout this whole ordeal, I felt understood and cautiously hopeful. Between her research and sheer determination, Dr. Barnaby Stonecrow helped us find a way to lure the creature out into the open using sacred rituals and ancient knowledge passed down through generations. To prepare for this intense confrontation, we spent days studying the rituals and gathering the necessary materials, potent herbs, sacred carvings, and blessed amulets that were said to hold power over the spirit world. Fearful of what lay ahead yet determined to protect our loved ones, we ventured into the dense woods where the Chenikara had last been spotted. As we stood in a small clearing bathed in moonlight, Dr. Barnaby Stonecrow guided us in reciting the ancient incantations. The air around us grew colder, and an eerie wind whispered through the trees, making our skin crawl with anticipation. Suddenly, the Chinakara appeared before us with a chilling howl that sent tremors down our spines. Its glowing eyes bore into us as it stalked closer, clearly enraged by our intrusion into its domain. In that moment of desperation and terror, we held fast to the sacred amulets and recited the incantations with newfound resolve. Just as it seemed the creature would reach us and tear us asunder like it did Kohana's cattle, it stopped. While it took all of our strength not to cower in fear, we began to sense a shift within the horrid beast. Its once malevolent glare seemed muddled by confusion or pain. With Dr. Barnaby Stonecrow's guidance, we maintained our focus on confronting the Chenikara until dawn broke over the horizon, bathing us in warm sunlight and diminishing whatever dark hold had afflicted this powerful spirit. As rays of sunlight pierced through the thick canopy of trees, the menacing creature began to dissolve into wisps of smoky haze before vanishing entirely from sight. Incredibly relieved but exhausted beyond belief, we vowed never again to underestimate the stories from our ancestors that spoke of such unseen forces lurking in the shadows. Word of our fateful encounter spread throughout the community, and though some dismissed it as pure superstition and fabrication, many began to question the thin line between legend and reality. The Chenikara was no longer just a piece of folklore, but a sobering reminder of the mysteries that remained hidden in the depths of this ancient land. It was a typical Tuesday evening and I had just finished my shift at the local diner. I never thought much about Old Pine Creek, the tiny town tucked away in Wyoming where I grew up, but that night something was off. There was a stillness in the air, and it made me shiver despite heading out from the warmth of the diner. My name is Ahastin Silvermoon, but people around town just call me Ash. I'm one of the few Cheyenne Native Americans living in Old Pine Creek. It's a small community, and everyone knows each other's business. I never imagined something sinister would find its way into our mundane lives. 
Stuff like that just didn't happen here. As I walked along Main Street toward my old beat-up pickup truck, I noticed I was apprehensive. My coworker and close friend Margot had mentioned earlier that some kids had found slaughtered livestock just outside town, their innards strewn all over, as if attacked by a wild beast. At first, we dismissed it as some kind of prank or drunken accident. But as I reached my truck, something didn't feel right. Then it dawned on me, there were no sounds of nature, no crickets or distant howls of coyotes. It was eerily quiet. That realization sent shivers down my spine. Over the next couple of days, whispers spread through town about strange sightings in the woods and fields, shadowy figures moving with unnatural speed and agility or large, unidentifiable tracks left behind in their wake. Still, none of us actually believed that anything otherworldly could be happening here. Friday night rolled around, and Margot invited me to join her group for a bonfire at Black Rock Field, just on the outskirts of town. There were six of us milling about, enjoying beers and casual conversation, when Raul, Margot's boyfriend, brought up his fascination with Native American folklore. Before I knew it, I found myself sharing old stories my grandpa passed along to me about the monstrous being known as Nelissa Philea. I was far from being a believer, and everyone shared that same skepticism. Our banter turned into laughter, mocking the idea of sinister creatures living in our neck of the woods. Then, without warning, there was a deep growl that reverberated through the night air. A primal fear washed over us as we exchanged bewildered looks. A moment later, we saw it, a creature hunched over near the edge of the tree line, almost humanoid but beast-like with elongated limbs and matted fur covering its body. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen or heard of before. The Nelissophilia our inebriated state left us frozen with terror as this monstrosity bore down upon us in a rage ripping effortlessly through our group like a tornado. Raul was torn from Margot's grasp as she screamed in desperation. Eddie, who stood next to his beloved girlfriend Maya, tried to fight back only to be tossed aside like a ragdoll with an agonizing crunch. The last thing I saw before fleeing from my life was Margot's horrified face while her attacker feasted on her entrails. Overwhelmed by adrenaline and fear, I ran until I could no longer feel my legs and my lungs burn for oxygen. By some stroke of luck or divine intervention, I managed to escape that hellish night. In the aftermath of the attack, once the horrible truth had sunk in, I learned that those gruesome incidents with the livestock were just the beginning. It took me days to piece everything together from whispers around town and sober confessions from a nearby reservation elder who believed he had seen such a creature before. As word of the massacre spread, our once peaceful town was gripped by panic. I couldn't shake the image of Margot's lifeless body, and even with no remaining evidence of the monstrosity we encountered, I knew in my heart that it existed. Consumed by grief and fear, I became obsessed with understanding Melissa Philea and determined to protect Old Pine Creek from its wrath. Main Street, once full of life, now echoed with fear and suspicion as our community tried to come to terms with these terrifying events. I began seeking out knowledge from other Native American tribes. Some dismissed my story as mere legend or folklore while others shared fragments of information about stories passed down by their ancestors. As days turned into months, I traveled across Wyoming armed with a deepened respect for the ancient wisdom and sacred rituals that had been carried through generations. The tragedy had transformed my skepticism into an endless pursuit of truth. In this journey for knowledge, I not only discovered ways to protect my town from further attacks but also developed a greater understanding of my Cheyenne heritage along with a growing connection to our spiritual lore, things I had never fully appreciated before. 
In time, Old Pine Creek slowly started to heal as new stories emerged. Children's laughter resounded between its streets once more, and festive community gatherings brought back a sense of warmth that had been lost. As for myself, having witnessed firsthand the dark side of our world and the unknown predators lurking beyond the tree line, whether human or supernatural, I vowed to continue pursuing the knowledge necessary to safeguard our town from any future attacks. Little did I know then that this encounter was just the beginning of a much larger journey into discovering more buried secrets hidden among Wyoming's hills. It started with a phone call. I picked up the receiver and heard heavy breathing on the other end. A low, guttural voice whispered, You're next. I chuckled, thinking it was one of my buddies playing a prank on me. But that momentary amusement quickly faded when the stench of fresh blood filled my nostrils as I found my neighbor's brutally slaughtered dog in my backyard, half-eaten. My name is Kylon Iron Cloud, a member of the Cheyenne tribe. I've lived here in Rapid City, South Dakota, all my life. It's a quiet town. No one would expect this kind of carnage here. I'd seen gruesome deer carcasses in hunting season and the mutilated mob victims back when I interned at the morgue, but this? This was different. It was as if some unknown beast had laid claim to my territory. I decided to examine the remains further, a decision I'd later come to regret. Lying there in the corner was a clump of coarse fur stuck in dried blood. As panic set in, I dialed Jake's number, my best friend since childhood and an expert hunter. He recognized the significance of what had happened and rushed right over. Kylon, this ain't just any animal, he said while examining the blood-spattered scene. What we're dealing with is something far worse. Ice formed in my chest at his words, but before he could explain further, an ear-piercing shriek echoed through the streets. We exchanged glances filled with terror and raced towards the sound. As we turned a corner, we stumbled upon Liana White Fox, another friend from high school. Clasped in her shaking hands was a photo of an enormous claw mark etched into her bedroom wall. Guys, what is this? She stuttered amid sobs. Jake raised an eyebrow. Now that's curious. It seems whatever is behind the killings is targeting those with native heritage. We took it upon ourselves to investigate further as we delved into ancient Native American myths in search of a potential lead. We spent the next few days chasing down stories and rumors but found nothing concrete. Throughout the week, the attacks grew bolder and more frequent. Entire cattle herds were found mutilated in farmers' fields. It was clear the beasts had graduated from pets to livestock, and humans could be next. One night, as we patrolled the area, we caught sight of those glowing red eyes. Just then, Jake whispered two spine-chilling words, Wendigo spirit. This folklore creature was said to transform its hosts, driven insane by hunger, into cannibalistic monsters. The hunt was on, but little did we know, it hunted us just as we hunted it. The Wendigo made its move at a bonfire party Jake had thrown as a misguided attempt at boosting morale. It tore through our friends like paper, each bite more ravenous than the last. Jake led the charge against the creature. We fought with all our might before driving it away from our town and into the vast wilderness nearby. In the aftermath of that blood-soaked battle, injured and weary, I pieced everything together from what Jake shared while searching for every scrap of information possible on Wendigos. I realized how close-knit our tribe was in defeating this ancient monstrosity. Days later, 
A news report claimed that an undisclosed military unit had killed a rabbit bear near our town. They were most likely covering up what had truly transpired, but deep down, I knew that although this Wendigo may have been destroyed, there might be others lurking in the shadows waiting for their chance to brutally devour their prey. In the following weeks, our quiet town began to rebuild and heal from the horrors that had befallen it. The traumatized survivors bonded together like never before, vowing to protect each other from any future threats. Jake, Liana, and I knew that we couldn't let our guard down. We had to be ready for the possibility that another Wendigo might rise. We started to train those willing to learn about tracking and hunting cryptids born of ancient myths. As our skills grew, so did the calling of our ancestors, urging us to listen to their stories, learn from their wisdom, and wield powerful tools once forgotten by modern society. Our mission expanded as we unearthed more legends detailing creatures hidden within the fabric of indigenous history. Our team evolved into a formidable force, combining modern technology with ancestral knowledge in what would soon be known as the Shadow Hunters. We traveled beyond Rapid City, responding to distress calls from other communities plagued by supernatural threats tied to their roots. In doing so, we became a beacon of hope for many who felt abandoned and lost in their fight against the darkness. As word spread about our fearless team of cryptid fighters, other tribes reached out to join our ranks or asked for guidance on how to counteract these nightmarish forces plaguing their lands. Warriors from all walks of life and diverse cultural backgrounds rallied together under one banner, protecting the innocent from what most couldn't even fathom existed. But as we delved deeper into the realm of ancient folklore, it became increasingly apparent that our world sheltered countless hidden dangers lurking beneath the surface, and every victory only made us hungrier for answers. I was sitting on my porch, a cup of coffee in hand, just enjoying another peaceful morning in Cheyenne country. You wouldn't think that one such morning could turn into a nightmare. My name is Heavy Bear, and I'm a Native American from the Cheyenne tribe. But it doesn't matter who I am, what matters is the terror that unfolded right before my eyes. It began as a seemingly innocuous event. A neighbor called me asking if I'd seen their dog, Coda. Knowing the vastness of our surroundings, I didn't think much of it at first. Animals wander off now and then. But one by one, more missing pets were reported. Our small community became frantic, searching for their loved ones and questioning each other about any unusual sightings or sounds. The sun had already set when my best friend, Tall Shadow, came to me with his own suspicions. Heavy bear, he began cautiously. I think there's something out there. What do you mean? I asked skeptically. I've been hearing things, growls and strange cries in the night, he replied. That night, we joined a few others in searching the woods, armed only with flashlights and hunting knives. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon something horrifying, the mutilated corpse of a deer. Its flesh had been brutally torn apart, and enormous claw marks covered its body. The gruesome discovery sent our adrenaline into overdrive as we scanned our surroundings, searching for what could have done this savage act. And suddenly, an earth-shattering roar echoed throughout the forest, freezing us in our tracks. Then, before us, appeared the most monstrous creature I had ever laid eyes on. Nidaquamo Ese is a terrifying mythological being from Cheyenne legends said to prey on those who venture too deep into its territory. Sharp claws readied high above its head like scythes that could tear anything apart, and its eyes were a cold, piercing blue that seemed to peer into your very soul. 
It wasn't until later on that someone mentioned the name and background of this foul beast. There was no time to waste. We had to think fast. We scattered in every direction, desperately trying to make our way back home. The creature lunged at those who were closest with its deadly talons, shredding them into pieces with terrifying precision. And yet, for all the darkness and despair enveloping me, there was also an inexplicable bond that grew within our group, the survival instinct that drove us together against the odds. We shouted warnings and coordinates to one another at every chance we got, growing ever more aware of our vulnerability. It was then that an idea crossed Tall Shadow's mind, turning animal traps against this creature. Quickly, silently stalking our foe from a safe distance, we found it powerful yet predictable in its pursuit patterns. With any luck and precious little time remaining, we hoped to ensnare Nidaquamo S.A. and put an end to this terror. The decisive moment came when it landed right on top of one of our traps. The steel jaws clanged shut around its limb, but not before it could still reach out and mortally wound yet another friend. Painful though the memory may be, victory was bittersweet at best. Days after our harrowing confrontation, I came across an old man who shared more than I had ever known about this legend, how Nidaquamo S.A. embodied the deepest fears of life beyond ordinary human control and compelled us even more to band together against all odds as one cornered tribe. Nowadays, life has returned to what we consider normal in Cheyenne country, but none of us will ever forget what terror lied hidden away in the woods surrounding our homes. A reminder that some nightmares are all too real. Though the terror of Nidaquamo S.A. has passed, our community still carries the scars of that fateful night. The loss of dear friends and loved ones has left a void in our hearts, yet it has also brought us closer together than ever before. We now hold an annual ceremony in remembrance of those who perished, lighting candles and sharing stories to honor their lives. As time goes on, it has become a symbol of our unity, resilience, and the strength we have found in one another. In spite of the hardships we faced, the Cheyenne people have come through this tragedy as survivors. We have learned to appreciate the simple moments spent together on peaceful mornings, cherishing every memory shared and knowing that it is by standing close to one another that we can continue to face whatever lies ahead in this world of uncertain darkness. The legend of Nidaquamo S.A. still lingers in our minds. However, we tread with greater caution now and respect the sacred balance between our people and the natural world around us. Through this respect and unity, we vow to protect our home, preserve our culture, and remain vigilant against any forces that may seek to disrupt the harmony we have fought so hard to achieve. It all started on a seemingly ordinary evening as I returned to my apartment in Douglas, Wyoming. My name is Keanu Two Trees, a proud Cheyenne Native American working as a video editor at a local news station. It was around 7.30 p.m., and I noticed my neighbor, Joshua, hurriedly walking into the woods some distance from our complex. A bizarre sight given Joshua's usual routine of staying within the apartment. Curious, I decided to follow him and see what he was up to. The sun was hanging low in the sky as we ventured deeper into the wooded area, which grew more silent with each passing moment. To my surprise, Joshua met with another man who handed over an item wrapped in cloth and left hastily as Joshua began unwrapping it revealing an old-looking book. From the shadows of the trees, I observed them perform a ritual with unfamiliar symbols and markings. As they chanted, I felt a heavy sense of dread like never before. Suddenly, the ground shook slightly, and something appeared behind the two men, a snarling creature that resembled both a wolf and an emaciated human. 
As its name suggests, it's called Wendigo, a shapeshifter of Native American folklore, and it attacks savagely. It tore through both men with alarming yet brutal efficiency before turning its bloodshot eyes towards me, like it sensed my presence in the woods. In that moment I knew I had witnessed something so horrifying that it would haunt me for the rest of my life. Panicked, my body kicked into high gear as I sprinted back towards civilization. I locked myself in my apartment for days, plagued by horrifying theories about what transpired. Every subtle sound provoked fear about the creature's possible return, a thought that birthed sleepless nights and paralyzing paranoia. When I mustered the courage to leave my apartment again five days later, police cars littered the streets outside the complex. Detectives informed me that the mutilated bodies of both Joshua and the stranger had been found. Didn't you hear it last night? A police officer whispered with a shiver, referring to a horrifying howling sound that resonated through the woods near the crime scene. I kept silent about my encounter that night knowing full well that no amount of honesty would absolve them of the terror they'd soon face. In the weeks following, disappearances and gruesome murders began forming a deadly pattern throughout town. Night after night, I heard screams and cries for help deep within the woods, horrific sounds revealing perhaps too late that local folktales were all too real. Paranoia took firmer roots in my psyche, making every step outside feel like an insurmountable risk. I turned to Linnea Silverton, a friend and local expert about Native American myths, seeking answers about Wendigos, who prey on human flesh. She confirmed the existence of such creatures, sharing evasive measures for survival, including spiritual guidance and strict adherence to indigenous beliefs. With a newfound resolve, I set out to confront this monstrous entity before more lives could be snuffed out. The decaying aura around town grew worse with each passing day, its transformation from a quaint sanctuary into an eerie final destination seemed seemingly irreversible. And so it continued as we battled this hellish creature lurking in those dismal woods. With each encounter becoming deadlier, Bloody attacks made headlines daily while terror painted itself into every corner of our reality. This palpable fear birthed heroes and cowards alike. Age-old stories of bravery met the eyes of historians with new revelations rivaling any sleepless nights for months to come. Even now, as I share these haunting tales of death and destruction in my small town, one thing remains an indefatigable truth. I will never forget what transpired during those horrific weeks in Douglas, Wyoming. The carnage I witnessed at the hands of Wendigo will follow me through my days like an ill shadow cast on the remnants of bygone tragedies. And although I will never regain the sense of safety that was violently torn from my world, I will keep hunting, for the unexplainable forces lurking in the corners of our reality must be overcome or made known to those who will listen. Despite the insurmountable fear that threatened to consume me, I refused to let the darkness define my existence. The terror I once felt has metamorphosed into a resilient determination to harness the power of my Cheyenne heritage and stand against the supernatural forces that dared disrupt our lives. This personal crusade has led me to delve deeper into indigenous myths, lore, and rites, unlocking a wealth of knowledge that transcends time and serves as an invaluable resource against evil forces lurking in the shadows. My connection with Linnea Silverton has become an unshakable alliance, unearthing strategies to combat the ever-present threats present in our environment. Each life lost now serves as a painful reminder of the grave responsibility we carry with us preserving the peace for those who remain and protecting innocent souls oblivious to dangerous secrets lurking just beyond their scope of reality. In the years since our small town became besieged by unimaginable terrors, I have emerged from isolation as a hunter, venturing far and wide to learn from others who share similar unnerving experiences. 
I preserve my people's wisdom and traditional methods, passing them on to those willing to acknowledge that some secrets are worth unveiling in our quest for understanding and harmony with nature. As the sun sets each day, casting shadows over Douglas, Wyoming, I now find solace in knowing that perhaps my role is greater than what I could have ever imagined, powerlessly spiraling into this engulfing abyss or emerging as a beacon of guiding light for those who seek answers in this uncertain world filled with unexplained phenomena. It all began in the quiet town of Greensburg, Indiana. July 15, 1996, was when everything changed, forever. I'm Kieran Grayell, and this is the terrifying recollection of my encounter with a creature straight out of our people's legends, the Nalissa Cheeto. Feeling hungry and restless, I decided to head to the nearby diner with my cousin Marcus before it closed at midnight. As we hopped into my beat-up Ford truck, Marcus lit a cigarette, taking a long drag before cracking open a can of cheap beer. Just don't get my seats wet, I grumbled. He mocked an offended gasp, and we both shared a chuckle. At the diner, we exchanged small talk as we consumed greasy burgers and fries. We continued to chat about random topics until we slowly found ourselves delving into darker subjects, questioning how well we truly knew our own town. Neither of us would have imagined how soon those disturbing thoughts would manifest into reality. As we headed back home on that fateful night, my headlights illuminated something slumped by the side of the road. Our initial amusement turned to alarm once we realized it was a body. Cautiously approaching, our worst fears were confirmed. Poor Tommy Whitehorse was lying there lifeless. His body was badly mangled and covered in gruesome lacerations like nothing we'd ever seen. What sent chills down our spines was that his face appeared frozen in a silent scream. Marcus took out his cell phone and called for help, but he could barely get his words out without stammering. We didn't wait around for help to arrive. It already felt like danger loomed too close for comfort. Driving away from the scene as quickly as possible, tension filled every mile between us and home. Over the next few days, more bodies started turning up in odd places, all of them bearing the same deep, savage gashes as Tommy's. Fear gripped Greensburg, and everyone felt eyes constantly watching them. Then one night, while returning home after another tiring day, I felt those very same unseen eyes bearing down on me. It was then that I saw it, the Nalissa Cheeto. The creature that had been tormenting our town was the living embodiment of an old Cheyenne legend, a large black shadow spirit with fearsome claws and teeth. My heart raced as it stalked closer, sensing my vulnerability. I struggled to find the keyhole as panic took over, my hands trembling with urgency. As I pushed the door open and slammed it shut behind me, I caught a glimpse of its glowing red eyes boring into me. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I called Marcus, and we banded together to research whatever information we could find about the Nalissa Cheeto. We discovered it could be warded off using certain rituals such as sacred sage smudging and chanting ancient prayers of protection. Relying on our newfound knowledge, a series of restless days and sleepless nights ensued as we protected not only ourselves but also our community from the ferocious beast. But the closer we got to understanding how to drive it away, the more aggressive and cunning it became. Finally, after weeks of chasing it through abandoned trails and forgotten corners of Greensburg, we successfully banished the spirit back into its eternal shadows, or so we hope. The town has long since returned to its peaceful state, though my friend tells me rumors continue to circulate about strangers who encountered something dark on their way through Greensburg.
stranded motorists on late night drives never quite making it out alive. To this day, none of us know what caused such an ancient monster to stir from its eternal slumber. We can only pray it doesn't return again ever. Some years have passed since those harrowing events in Greensburg, but my life has never been the same. The memory of Melissa Cheeto's venomous gaze is burned into my mind, and at times I find myself glancing over my shoulder, fearing that it still lurks in the shadows. Marcus and I rarely speak of it anymore. The pain and terror we both experience seem too heavy to bear. Yet, despite the unspoken agreement to keep our past hidden, we both can sense that something has changed within us. We're more vigilant now, more attuned to the unnatural whispers carried on the wind or the chilling sensation of an otherworldly presence. A bond formed between us, a silent understanding that we must carry that horrible secret for the rest of our lives. We've also become protectors of sorts using our knowledge to help others who have unknowingly crossed paths with similar sinister beings. From time to time, when the horrifying memories return with vengeance, I seek comfort in those ancient rituals that once saved us from darkness. The soothing scent of sage smoke calms my anxiety-ridden heart as I murmur long-forgotten prayers under my breath. Even so, I know deep down that true peace will never be mine again. A part of me will always remain at war with that shadowy serpent, hoping fervently that no others meet its malevolent grasp. I was sitting at the Oxbow Diner in Grable, Wyoming, nursing a lukewarm cup of coffee. The time was 11.43 p.m. I had just finished my shift at the local sawmill and needed to unwind. My name is now a black horse, and I'm a Cheyenne native. I grew up on a nearby reservation, never quite escaping the tight grip of poverty. As I took a sip, I couldn't shake off a strange feeling in the air. It was like an unspoken tension had seeped into the diner's atmosphere. I exchanged some dry humor with my pals, Jim, Bulldog, Saunders, and Mandy Lextock, but our conversation kept circling back to how quiet it was for a Friday night. Without warning, all chatter came to an abrupt halt as we heard distant howls. Jim and Mandy glanced out the window to catch sight of something indescribable our first encounter with what we didn't know yet would become our personal hell. My instincts were urging me to scram, but curiosity got the best of me as I walked towards the now pitch black window, trying to decipher what lurked in the shadows. The glowing eyes of a creature stood out among the thicket, large and elongated, with razor-sharp teeth barring down upon us in the deadly silence. Instinctively, we barricaded ourselves inside the diner, while our hearts raced with sheer terror. The creature assaulted relentlessly, destroying everything in its path, cars flipped over, hitching posts torn, and fences left shattered. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity of chaos and carnage, it vanished, leaving us bruised, battered, and desperate for answers. Sergeant Holt Donners arrived on the scene 30 minutes later, along with several fellow officers from other state patrols that happened to be nearby. Never one for superstitions or paranormal explanations for unusual occurrences, he believed there must have been a motive behind these attacks. We all gathered in town the following day, determined to piece together whatever information we could to uncover the truth about our attacker. The deeper we dug in our research, the more puzzled we were. However, Chief John Edgewater stumbled upon an old Native American legend of a fearsome creature known as Windiga. Tucked away in the dusty corners of forgotten libraries, we found that Windiga was a malevolent spirit capable of transforming ordinary men into monstrous cannibals driven by insatiable hunger. 
Initially skeptical of such stories and their relevance to our situation, we couldn't ignore the historical accounts and unnerving drawings that bore an uncanny resemblance to what we had seen that night. We suddenly felt exposed and unarmed against this ancient creature, which defied any rational explanation for its ability to ambush and terrorize so effectively. Its hunting prowess left even the seasoned hunters among us feeling anything but confident. Jim proposed seeking out an elderly native spiritual guide who lived deep within the surrounding forests. He reasoned that she might know how to confront this beast. We embarked on this journey with hope half eaten away by fear. As fate would have it, there was no mistaking it. The moment she laid eyes on us, she knew why we were there. She retold tales of Wendigo in chilling detail. Its horrifying appetite and relentless nature, it fed on man's anguish as much as his flesh. Armed with grisly knowledge and relics provided by the spiritual guide, we redoubled our defenses, embarking on long nights of patrolling our town while struggling against choking dread. Our first skirmish with Wendigo left three officers dead unrecognizable when their mauled bodies were recovered in the morning light. Barely clinging to sanity, I resolved, along with my remaining companions, that although terrified beyond measure, we would fight to the epic and heart-rending end if necessary. It took weeks of grueling survival and a constant battle against this abomination as Wendigo continued terrorizing our community. In the final confrontation, we joined forces with neighboring towns, reinforcing our dwindling numbers by using ancient knowledge and weapons crafted from the spiritual guide's teachings. Finally cornered, Wendigo made one last assault, its twisted, inhuman form contorting violently as it faced its demise. Our lives would forever be scarred by this nightmare, but we had won freedom for generations to come. Weeks after the ordeal had ended, we found ourselves struggling to return to normalcy. The town of Grable, Wyoming, would forever carry the weight of that harrowing experience. Some moved away, unable to shake the memories that haunted them day and night. Others went into therapy, hoping to find solace and understanding among professionals trained in coping with trauma. As for Jim, Mandy, and me, our connection only grew stronger as we faced our inner demons and forged the bond that was born from our shared nightmare. The vague feeling of tranquility we once knew slipped further into the rearview mirror of our lives as we continued our watchful duty over the town. Our story was met with disbelief and skepticism by many outside our community, but the survivors knew better than to dismiss the tales of horror that lingered in the shadows and haunted the fringes of our very souls. I still remember that fateful night, down to the very last detail. It was May 17th, 2008, and I had been hanging out with some of my buddies at the local bar off Route 67 in Fayette Springs, Pennsylvania. It's a small town where everybody knows everyone else's business, so when something unusual happens, it sure as hell doesn't go unnoticed. My name is Rodney Grayall, and I come from a long line of proud Cheyenne people. But on that night, my heritage seemed like the least important thing on my mind. We were just five guys having a good time, me, Dustin, Mike, Terrence, and Paul. We spent hours talking about our jobs and the shenanigans we usually got into during our spare time. As the night went on, we noticed something strange happening around town. The few streetlights that lit our way to the bar started flickering intermittently as if they were about to die out completely. But we shook it off as one of those unexplained electrical issues that occasionally plague small towns like ours. After saying our goodbyes and parting ways in the early hours of the morning, 
I found myself driving on an isolated stretch of road surrounded by dense woods. This was the quickest route back to my house, located on the outskirts of town. Suddenly, a large, dark figure appeared in front of my car, causing me to swerve off the road and come to a screeching halt. Catching my breath and realizing I was still alive, I squinted at its silhouette, which seemed both animalistic and strangely humanoid. What stood before me was a creature from American native folklore called the Wendigo, or at least something resembling it. I tried to calm myself down by reminding myself that there has to be a logical reason for what I'm seeing, maybe someone dressed up in a costume as a prank. But the more I stared at it, the more I was convinced otherwise. The creature suddenly lunged for an unsuspecting deer with incredible speed and precision that left no doubt as to its deadly intentions. I called my friends who lived nearby to tell them what I saw. But soon, after joining me, we all found ourselves deep in perplexity as this otherworldly figure had somehow vanished into thin air. We decided to investigate further, following faint tracks that led us deeper into the woods. We stumbled upon a gruesome scene, a small patch of earth soaked in blood, surrounded by the deer's decapitated head and limbs. None of us could bear the sight for too long, but it only confirmed our deepest fears that what we had encountered earlier was not merely a figment of our imagination. Our search continued until daylight crept through the treetops, revealing multiple signs of more victims claimed by this nightmarish creature. The realization dawned on my friends and me. We have to alert the authorities regarding what's happening around Fayette Springs. Weeks later, as we sat with others in a local diner nervously discussing theories about the beasts behind these horrendous attacks, an elderly man boasting generations of knowledge about American native folklore overheard our conversation. He explained that Wendigos were once believed to roam these forests, causing havoc and despair whenever they appeared, an embodiment of pure evil. Still haunted by the memories of that night, and uneasy about resurfacing stories we thought were forgotten. Only one thing is certain, something malevolent was lurking in our town's darkness. Today, I might not know how I survived this encounter or if it will ever cease leaving a bloody trail behind it. But there remains a chilling uncertainty that follows every step I take in those desolate woods. The knowledge that somewhere out there lies a merciless predator ready to strike again when least expected. Determined to protect our community and armed with this new knowledge, my friends and I decided to form a group dedicated to researching the Wendigo and finding a way to stop its reign of terror. We spent countless hours combing through old texts, reaching out to experts in the field of Native American mythology and even contacting tribal elders for advice. Slowly, we began piecing together the information needed to understand our adversary. According to our research, the Wendigo is born out of human greed, the desire for more when there's not enough. It is said that an ordinary person can become a Wendigo if lost in the forest and forced to turn to cannibalism for survival eventually becoming consumed by an insatiable hunger that drives them mad. Some legends speak of rituals that can contain or banish such creatures, while others suggest they can only be defeated through great acts of courage and self-sacrifice. With every new fact uncovered, my friends and I grew closer as a team. We split up responsibilities for tracking reported sightings, interviewing witnesses, and even attempting some makeshift solutions found in ancient lore. It was during one such mission that Mike, driven by profound courage, sacrificed himself to save the rest of us from the Wendigo's attack. Distraught but emboldened by his heroism, we resolved even more firmly to rid our home of this nightmare. As time went on and our actions gained the attention of the local media, other residents began joining our cause. 
Together, we strengthened Fayette Springs defenses by setting traps to deter future attacks and setting up a system for emergency assistance via a network of walkie-talkies. Years passed in relative peace as fewer incidents were reported. But still, we never managed to completely vanquish our enemy. Tales of the Wendigo would continue echoing through Fayette Springs, fading into myth again only to resurface after yet another sudden disappearance or gruesome attack. Though the creature remains at large today, the bond my friends and I share and our commitment to protect our town remain as strong as ever. Our lives have been forever changed by that fateful night, a reminder that there are still mysteries lurking within the shadows of our world, chilling presences waiting to strike when we least suspect them. Tuesday, June 19, 2007 I was just getting off work from my mundane office job. It was around 7 p.m., and I found myself in Chatham County, Georgia. My name is Tarson Val, and that night would change my life forever. I have Cheyenne heritage, so my family knows about creatures from Native American folklore. Little did I know that I'd encounter one of them myself. First things first, though, let me tell you what led to that night's events. It started with a simple knock on the door. A couple of old friends had dropped by unannounced for a visit. We sat down in the living room, catching up on each other's lives. There were Brina and Javan, an adventurous outdoors a couple who constantly got themselves into trouble, and Mateo, a genius when it came to technology. As we chatted away, Brina mentioned their recent camping trip near some old ruins they discovered deep in the forest. They insisted we check it out together that weekend, considering it one of their best adventures yet. Fast forward to Friday night, when we were all heading out to the forest campsite Brenna and Javan described earlier that week. We parked our car at the campsite's entrance and proceeded on foot. The sun had already set, and the crickets chirping filled the air. Just as we got settled in the campsite surrounded by tall trees, we heard distant whispers and rustling noises in the darkness around us. At first, we passed it off as simply being nature's sounds and continued setting up our tents. As the night wore on, however, each of us began noticing strange occurrences, rocks thrown at our tents or weird, shining eyes hiding in the dark foliage. The strangest part was that no one said anything because we didn't want to spoil the trip by showing any fear. Little did we know that silence would escalate the impending danger. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the night. We all rushed out of our tents to see where it came from, only to find Mateo half-conscious and bloodied on the ground, his eyes wide with terror. On his legs were deep gashes that looked like they had been made by powerful claws. That was when we all began to panic. What could have done this to Mateo? The answer wasn't long in coming. At that moment, we spotted it crawling out from behind some bushes nearby, a tall, hunched creature with huge claws and glowing eyes. It looked like something straight out of Native American folklore and we instantly knew it was dangerous. Brina suddenly recalled the creature she'd heard about in stories her great-grandmother told her. They called it Izanami. According to those legends, it stalked and preyed on lone travelers at night. According to the stories, this creature was intelligent and capable of incredible evil deeds. We were facing an enemy unlike anything we'd ever experienced before. Not knowing its motives or intents only heightened our fear. Our hearts raced as we struggled to come up with a plan, particularly for Mateo, who was too injured to leave on his own accord. With no other option available, 
Javan decided to venture into the forest for help while Brina and I desperately tried to fend off Izanami's relentless attempts at attacking the rest of us. Hours passed as Brina and I struggled through our ordeal. Exhaustion from adrenaline began settling in just as dawn approached. Finally, Javan returned with a search party from town who'd been alerted when we failed to return our car's keys at the camp office. They were armed with shotguns and rifles. Izanami hesitated and disappeared back into the shadows of the forest. We carried Mateo out of the forest while the search party remained on high alert for our attacker. A couple of days later, I heard from one of the townspeople that Izanami had not been seen since that weekend. The search party had scared it off, or so we hoped. Since that day, I've never looked at the wilderness in the same way. The legends my family would speak about were not just tales but real-life horrors waiting to strike when we least expected them. Living through such an experience taught me to always be prepared for something far beyond our comprehension and to never underestimate the power of ancient folklore and mythology. Those stories were passed down through generations for a reason, as a way to keep us aware of the mysteries surrounding us. As time has passed since our encounter with the Zanami, I've made it a mission to learn more about the legends and creatures that inhabit the world around us. Knowledge, I've realized, can be our greatest defense against the unknown. For myself, Brina, and Javan, our lives were irrevocably changed that night in Chatham County. Mateo eventually recovered from his injuries but never again set foot in a forest. His innocence was lost and he couldn't shake the memories of that horrifying night. As for the rest of us, we are still drawn to adventure and exploration, but with a newfound sense of caution and respect for the hidden dangers that may lurk just beyond the reach of our understanding. So when you venture forth into nature's embrace or listen closely to those ancient tales, remember that there is always more to this world than meets the eye. I remember it like it was yesterday, sitting at Ye Old Crow, a local bar that's been in this town for as long as I can remember. I had just gotten off work from my usual night shift at the factory, and all I wanted was a drink and some conversation. This place was my preferred spot to unwind after a hard shift. The date was August 27, 1999 and the time must have been around 11 at night. My name is Deacon Redfeather, born and raised right here in this small Montana town. As I paid for my drink and scanned the room, chatting with familiar faces, I didn't realize that an eerie encounter was about to unfold before my eyes. I caught sight of a strangely dressed man sitting alone in the corner booth. He didn't look familiar. He must have been passing through town or something. It wasn't unusual for travelers to stop by our little watering hole on their way to God knows where. About twenty minutes into sipping my beer, my laughter suddenly stopped, and the air felt heavy. That guy in the corner booth kept staring at me with an unsettling grin on his face, which sent chills down my spine. It felt like forever before he started to speak. It's getting late, and I heard there's a full moon tonight. You should probably head home, Deacon, he said, somehow knowing my name without an introduction. I shot a puzzled look his way before brushing it off. I figured one of the locals might have told him as part of a hazing ritual meant for out-of-towners. I took one last sip of my beer, deciding it was better not to stick around for whatever this stranger had planned. As I stepped outside into the crisp night air, an overwhelming sense of dread enveloped me. For some reason, I couldn't shake this unsettling feeling gnawing at me. Making haste towards my pickup truck, parked near the edge of the woods, I noticed something odd. The woods were dead silent, 
No rustling leaves or singing crickets. This was anything but normal. Before I could comprehend what was happening, there was a horrific screeching sound penetrating the silence. It pierced my ears with its intensity, and I could feel the hairs on my neck stand up. My instincts screamed at me to run, but a strange curiosity kept me rooted to the spot. As if on cue, a massive creature emerged from the dark shadows of the woods, standing over seven feet tall with long claws and a chillingly humanoid face. This thing wasn't like any animal I had seen before. It was straight out of native folklore. It was the legendary Wendigo, an evil creature that feasts upon the flesh of humans. It lunged in my direction with lightning-quick fury while letting out another screeching roar. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, pushing me to leap for my life into my truck's cabin. Fumbling with the keys, Every second felt like an eternity as I wedged them into the ignition and gunned it out of there, just as this abomination smashed its heavy claws against my tailgate. Over the next few days, strange events continued across town. People reported mutilated livestock and sightings of a tall beast lurking on the outskirts. No one could figure out why it was happening or how to stop it until something made sense. That mysterious man at the bar. Gathering up what little courage I could muster after questioning folks around town, I traced that eerie stranger to an old motel just outside city limits. Shaking like a leaf, I approached, demanding answers about these horrific events and why he knew who I was. He chuckled eerily before replying in a low voice. The Wendigo! It only emerges when called upon by those consumed by the darkest of desires. I'm just an observer of the chaos it sows. He stared into my eyes one last time, then vanished without a trace. The Wendigo eventually retreated deep into the woods, never to be seen again. There's an uncomfortable silence around town now. No one wants to admit what they know or dwell on the carnage we've all witnessed. Maybe it's best that way, for if we ever forget the fear and pain caused by the Wendigo and its mysterious summoner, we risk succumbing to our darkest desires and inviting that malevolent force back into our lives once more. Years passed since that unsettling encounter, yet whispers of the Wendigo and the mysterious stranger still circulated among the townspeople. Attempting to sweep it under the rug, most folks focused on their daily lives and attempted to restore normalcy in our small community. But for me, this event had left a deep scar and birthed an insatiable thirst for knowledge about the supernatural world, fueling my desire to protect our town from any other malevolent forces that may come our way. Eventually, I found myself seeking out others who had experience with unexplained phenomena. We gathered in secret gaining knowledge by sharing our own harrowing encounters as well as learning from ancient lore and old books. Together, we became guardians of our own kind, knowing that the darkness always lurked at the edge of the shadows, waiting for a chance to strike again. In time, life in our peaceful Montana town went on without any further disturbances. The memory of the Wendigo and the mysterious stranger began to fade for most people, becoming nothing more than whispered legends around late-night campfires or cautionary tales shared among friends at ye old crow after a few too many drinks. But for those of us who had felt that paralyzing fear and witnessed unimaginable horrors, we remained vigilant, ready to stand against whatever evil might come next. I couldn't have known that a routine trip to the local bar would spiral into terror. I locked my front door and began the short walk from my apartment to the rusty bucket. It was a place I'd frequented since moving to this quiet little town in rural Oregon. My name's Kian Setsahest, an ordinary guy of Cheyenne descent working as a mechanic. 
After a long week, I was more than ready to cut loose for the night with some friends and enjoy a cold beer or two. I walked into the bar, greeted by the familiar faces of people I'd come to know over my time in town. They nodded appreciatively at me. We were all here to escape our daily worries, if only for one night. I ordered my drink, and that's when he entered. His name was Travis Orlin, but everyone called him the trench coat man, because, well, you guessed it, he always wore this beat-up old trench coat no matter what the weather. A few of us got talking about him and realized none of us really knew much about him beyond his preference for wearing that old coat. Noticing him sitting alone at the far end of the room nursing a whiskey, something suddenly felt off. The air around us seemed heavier, and the laughter that typically filled the room went deathly silent. All eyes turned to Trenchcoat Man as he downed his whiskey and bolted out the door. That was weird, said Dave Adams, my best friend since high school who had moved out here with me after college. None of us thought too much of it. After all, there was no reason to expect anything malicious from him just another eccentric regular at our cozy little neighborhood spot. However, in retrospect, maybe we should have paid more attention to those eerie vibes. The following night, news broke that a local farm had been attacked. Animals were found slaughtered and mangled in ways none of us could comprehend, and it wasn't just livestock. Pets belonging to the farm owners were among the victims. With panic setting in, the townsfolk convened at the Rusty Bucket, our usual gathering place for discussing matters of importance. Our trusted town sheriff, George Dalton, told us that he'd received word of a possible suspect in this brutal act of violence. A man fitting Travis Orland's description was seen entering the farm late last night, just an hour or two after our eerie encounter with him. In disbelief, we shared our story and unease with Sheriff Dalton, who began investigating Travis further. As we sipped beers, we commented on how something about him had never quite seemed human. An older patron named Hugh tapped me on the shoulder and whispered that a powerful ancient evil was lurking within Travis Orlin, although he didn't elaborate any further. As more gruesome attacks occurred, each one escalating in violence and gore, people went from feeling relatively safe on our small town streets to barricading their homes for fear of what might come next. The trenchcoat man became a name whispered in fear, something prowling the edges of society that we couldn't dare confront head on. It was only when Dave went missing after visiting me one night that my paranoia spiked beyond reason. I knew something evil was preying on our town and had to be dealt with if I wanted to have any chance of finding my friend alive. Gathering some of my most trusted allies, we armed ourselves with makeshift weapons and decided it was time to hunt down the menace that had disrupted our peaceful surroundings. We tracked the trenchcoat man into the woods using tips from people who'd seen him walking there alone at dusk. Finally, we managed to surround him in an isolated clearing. As if knowing he was cornered, a monstrous transformation occurred before our eyes. The seemingly innocuous Travis Orlin we had once known was gone, now replaced by the stuff of nightmares. It was a horrifying creature with unnatural strength and agility. None of us recognized it, but the abhorrent force within Travis matched Hugh's description. It was a being whispered in Cheyenne and other Native American folklore known as Asterisk Shia, a malevolent creature born from hatred and human suffering. We fought tooth and nail, risking our lives, to rid our town of this horror. Astonishingly, we prevailed. The creature lay dead at our feet, but no one celebrated. The overwhelming sense of relief was marred by the grim reality of what we had just witnessed and the losses our community had suffered. As we made our way back into town, I couldn't help but wonder if this was truly the end or if other beings like Shia lurked in the shadows, waiting for their moment to strike. 
Our town, once a haven of peace and tranquility, could never be the same again. Traumatized by our ordeal, each of us did our best to rebuild and carry on. The rusty bucket lost its appeal as a carefree escape instead becoming a somber reminder of the darkness that had once dwelled within its walls. Time passed slowly, but, as it often does, life found a way to go on. We would always remember those we lost and cautiously embrace a new sense of normalcy, one that was vigilant against the unknown and dark forces lingering at the edges of our world. And though we could never erase those harrowing memories, we did what we could to protect our future and ensure that generations to come would tell the story of the Trenchcoat Man, both as a cautionary tale and an enduring testament to humanity's resilience in the face of pure evil. It was a cold December evening and I had just finished my shift at the warehouse in Lakewood, Colorado. My name is Tavius Silverfeather, and if you'd asked me back then, I'd have told you there was no such thing as monsters. I was grabbing a drink with my friends at a local bar when the bartender jokingly told us about a creature that wandered the woods nearby. We laughed it off, not giving it much thought, but soon we would realize how wrong we were. Hours passed as we enjoyed our night out. Halfway through our third round, a stranger stumbled into the bar, bloodied and bruised, insisting that something was after him. He was Walker Little Bear. I recognized him from the newspaper's coverage of his recent return to town after years of absence. At first, we all dismissed his claims as drunken nonsense. That was until we heard the chilling howls echoing outside the bar. Gripped by curiosity and fearing for Walker's safety, we couldn't ignore this any longer. We hesitantly ventured into the night's darkness, searching for any sign of trouble. The once familiar streets transformed into an eerie labyrinth beneath the moonlight. As I led the group towards Walker's home, expecting to find evidence of his claims or at least any break-in, we were met with a gruesome sight. The front door had been ripped off its hinges, with claw marks visible on the edges. Inside lay a trail of shattered glass and broken furniture leading to Walker's sister's lifeless body, her flesh torn apart as if mauled by some wild beast. The panic set in, but we knew there was no turning back now. Armed with whatever tools we could find, crowbars, baseball bats, we decided to confront this unknown foe head-on. As we tracked its path deeper into the woods behind Walker's home, we discovered several grisly scenes of other victims. Doubts now gave way to an undeniable certainty. We were dealing with a Wendigo, a horrifying creature from our native folklore known for its insatiable hunger for human flesh. As we continued our pursuit, we weren't just searching for this beast. We were hoping to find any survivors if we were lucky. By the time we encountered the Wendigo, it had begun feasting upon another mangled body. Its tall, gaunt figure reeked of death. Even at a distance, its piercing red eyes burned into our souls. We charged at it, blinded by rage and grief, but it moved with unnatural agility. The battle was intense and brutal. Our makeshift weapons were no match for its relentless strength. The Wendigo picked us off one by one, clawing and biting its way through the group. As I fought with everything I had left and backed into a seemingly inescapable corner of the forest, an unexpected blow saved my life. A local park ranger who'd been tracking the creature's killings for weeks appeared just in time to shoot the Wendigo directly in one of its eyes weakening it long enough for us to regroup and fatally wound it. We spent many hours patching ourselves up afterward in stunned disbelief over what had transpired. 
It wasn't until days later that we learned from an elder that the beast was once a man who had become twisted by hunger and greed and cursed by the spirit world as punishment for his actions. I am left haunted by that experience and forever shaped by what I saw that night in Lakewood. I pray that I never have to face such darkness again, the kind of darkness that proves monsters are indeed real and lurking among us in this world. Months have gone by since that horrifying night, but the memories still linger like a dark shadow over my everyday life. Walker and I, bound by our collective trauma, found solace in each other's company, and our friendship grew to be ever stronger. Together, we are now committed to preventing any similar tragedies from befalling others. We've started a group focused on educating others about the dangers of the supernatural world and how to protect themselves from evil beings that may exist among us, obscured by the veil of darkness. Every evening, we patrol the woods near Lakewood, carrying the lessons we learned and ensuring local residents remain safe in their homes. With each passing day, we honor the memory of those who lost their lives battling creatures beyond comprehension praying for their souls to find peace. People's attitudes towards supposed legends have begun to shift as well. No longer dismissed as mere tales or drunken nonsense, the stories passed down through generations hold weight within our community. They understand that these tales hold power and teachings meant for our survival. A bittersweet sense of unity has emerged from our shared experiences and we now live with the awareness that reality can sometimes be stranger than fiction. As I stare into the darkness each night before patrol, I can't help but feel a chill run down my spine. A reminder that life is fragile and that malevolent forces reside in places we never expect. Despite everything we've been through and all our efforts to educate others, one truth persists. Monsters do indeed exist among us hidden from plain sight. Vigilant as we may be now, it's hard not to wonder what other dangers are lurking just beyond our sight line, waiting for an opportunity to strike. July 18th 2021 that's when my life took a sudden turn. Living in Blackstone, Montana, you'd think only peaceful days would fill someone's summer, but I was wrong. It started off with a drive to the local convenience store to grab some snacks and hang out with friends. My name is Cayman Eagle Feather, and what I experienced that day still sends shivers down my spine. At the store, I bumped into Miles Hawthorne, a childhood friend who helped me endure my toughest times growing up as a Cheyenne American native. We quickly caught up before I had to head back home. The evening sun cast shadows across the town as I retraced my steps. It wasn't until I turned down Garfield Street that an uneasy sensation washed over me. I tried to brush it off as just some irrational fear, but it persisted. As I continued walking, Noises from bushes nearby broke the silence of the serene town. Heart pounding, I looked around me for any signs of trouble but found nothing. Moments later, Alex Fletcher, an old high school friend, emerged from behind a tree nearby and exclaimed how he had found his lost dog that had gone missing for days. Relieved, I carried on with my journey home. Over the next few days, more strange occurrences happened around town. Mysterious disappearances and mutilated animals were discovered in noticeable numbers. The police investigated but found no definitive leads about what was happening. Night fell on one of those dreary days when Lexi Malcolm called in tears about stumbling upon mutilated remains in the woods near her house. Fearing more danger lurking around town, myself and those who cared, assuming this wasn't just some prank, decided to search the area for clues. As we combed through the thick foliage in total darkness, bickering among ourselves, my mind raced with panic, 
trying to comprehend our situation. Each step plunged us deeper into the unknown. That's when we heard it, the blood-curdling scream that echoed through the night. Rushing to its origin, we found a terrified family trying to fend off a dark figure. The beast, which I now recognize as the legendary Nalissa Fally, brutally attacked, ultimately disappearing back into the shadows with one of our own. Shaking in cold fear, we realized we were facing a monster thought only to exist in folklore. Its sinister presence had mercilessly invaded our community, bringing destruction and terror upon us all. Desperation gripped us as we struggled to find ways to survive, protect our loved ones, and reveal the identity of our attacker. In the following days, more lives were claimed by the merciless Nalissa Philea, and each instance escalated our fear for each other's safety. Frantically attempting to solve the mystery and end this nightmare, we scoured forgotten Cheyenne American texts for answers. It was only when I reached out to talk with an elderly tribe member that the creature's origin was revealed. It remained nameless but has been known since ancient times to wreak havoc on unsuspecting communities. Armed with this revelation, Lexi and I devised a dense plan to kill it or drive it far away from town, away from our lives forever. The days that followed involved many risky maneuvers and near-death experiences but miraculously culminated in a climactic confrontation. Life gradually returned to normal as grief-stricken residents mourned their losses, a lingering reminder of our struggle against the abyss that threatened us all. But every now and then, in the darkness of night or on desolate paths alone on Garfield Street, I still wonder if it's genuinely gone or just waiting for us or another small town to strike again. Time went on, and the once fearful town of Blackstone slowly regained its peace. We could never forget those we had lost, and the memories of that harrowing summer lingered in our hearts. The townsfolk became a close-knit community, supporting one another as we rebuilt our lives from the ashes. It was during this period of healing that Miles Hawthorne suggested building a memorial as a tribute to the fallen, a place where we could honor their lives and remind ourselves of the courage that prevailed against the dark force enveloping our town. As the months passed, we worked together to create this sacred space in Blackstone's center, planting trees, laying bricks, and etching heartfelt dedications into a beautiful stone plaque. The memorial served not only as a remembrance, but also as a symbol of hope that such evil would not dare step inside our town again. Our shared experiences led to new bonds being formed and old friendships growing stronger, weaving an impenetrable web of love and protection around our once quiet town. We knew we could rely on each other should darkness ever attempt to return upon us. Our lives moved forward. Yet the lessons of that unforgettable summer remained etched within us, forever changing the pulse of our little Montana town. Most of the town was busy preparing for the annual Cheyenne Frontier Days Festival. But my day took a twisted turn when I stopped by the local bar for a quick drink. I sat at the counter, and for a small town Wyoming bar, it was unusually empty, just me and the bartender, Thomas Kincaid. We exchanged friendly banter as usual until an old timer walked in. I had never seen him around before, and his arrival was like that of a dark cloud. The old man settled down next to me with a glass of whiskey. Mustering up his courage, he started talking about horrific events that had occurred in the town's history. I dismissed it as morbid ramblings from someone who perhaps had won too many drinks. It wasn't until several days later that I connected the disturbing events he mentioned with an upcoming nightmare of my own. Being avid campers, my friend Hank Roberts and I decided to spend that weekend exploring Red Creek Canyon, deep in Wyoming's backcountry. 
On Saturday morning, we packed our gear and drove out early, determined to make the most of our weekend getaway. As our truck rumbled across bumpy dirt roads and further away from civilization, we felt excited about escaping into nature. Little did we know what awaited us there. We set up camp near a quiet creek under towering pine trees that provided a natural canopy overhead. With Hank's fishing skills and my knowledge of edible plants and berries from my Cheyenne ancestors, we managed to scavenge together a decent meal, feeling confident out there in nature's cradle. As dusk approached, Hank took off to collect firewood while I continued fishing beside the creek. To my surprise, I met another camper named Joe Rivers who was hiking through the area. After exchanging pleasantries over mutual interests in outdoor survival techniques and appreciating the beauty of our surroundings, Joe left to return to his own campsite. With the night closing in, Hank and I sat side by side around our makeshift fireplace. We traded tales of past adventures until the mild crackling of the fire turned into a cacophony of unsettling sounds, unclear whether they emerged from the dense forest or our overactive imaginations. Piercing through the darkness, we heard shrill cries and crunching footsteps. Our hearts pounded in unison as we considered the available weapons, a pocket knife and a couple of fishing rods. Determined to investigate the source, I hesitantly called out Joel's name, hoping he was playing a harmless prank on us, but no response came. We followed a trail of what appeared to be fresh blood, leading back toward the creek. Fear gripping every muscle of my body, I involuntarily clenched my knife harder with each step closer to what looked like the torn and mauled remains of poor Joel Rivers. Hank's voice trembled as he whispered about whispers he'd heard throughout town about a native folklore creature that could stalk, maim, and kill with gruesome speed and precision. Standing among the trees, surrounded by darkness adorned with distant howls and sinister giggles, I suddenly recalled the old-timer's ominous words, Skinwalker, that's what he claimed it was. Filled with terror and raised hair on my neck mixed with toxic regret for disregarding those words earlier that day, the sun-kissed survival instincts now gave way to nocturnal dread. Hank and I abandoned our camp and fled towards our truck at full throttle. Skinwalkers are shapeshifters found in native legends known for their evil intent. However, they rarely appear in Cheyenne folklore. But these details rushed into my weary mind days later when I discovered that more lives had been taken suspiciously since that unholy night. Though we escaped with our lives, I learned a valuable lesson. Sometimes, ancient tribal tales contain warnings deeply rooted in truth that are best not ignored. Haunted by the memories of that harrowing night, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Sleep eluded me as the weeks went on, and my once adventurous spirit seemed to wither. Hank, who had been my closest confidant during those chilling events, became distant, as if trying to outrun the specter of our shared experience. Our once unbreakable bond began to dissolve under the weight of that dreadful secret. I felt compelled to do something. So I delved into research on Cheyenne folklore and anything I could find about skinwalkers to understand how we had survived. My studies took me back to stories passed down from my ancestors, historical accounts distorted by time, and a growing web of native mythology intertwined with my own bloodline. Searching for solace within this labyrinthine maze of legends produced more questions than answers. Slowly, in the stillness of night and in quiet conversations with the wind's whispers, I learned that knowledge is a fickle gift, sometimes bringing hope but often opening new chasms of fear. Humbled by the limits of every earthly power and facing supernatural dangers, I embraced a newfound respect for such tales and caution towards venturing into their murky pasts. Driven to dispel these nightmares once and for all, I made peace with our narrow escape and vowed to honor the legacy 
and wisdom of those who came before me, heedful not only of nature's beauty, but also respectful of its hidden perils. I was out celebrating my recent promotion with some buddies at a local dive bar on the outskirts of Casper, Wyoming. The place was nothing special, just a joint filled with people drowning their sorrows in cheap alcohol. But for us, it was our go-to spot for blowing off steam. My name is Akachita Stone Cloud, but people call me Aki for short. I'm a 32-year-old Cheyenne native working as an engineer for a big construction company in town. The roughnecks I hung out with that night were workmates, Kyle and Martin. They were the type to live hard while cracking jokes and tossing back shots of Redditor's Gulp, our favorite whiskey. We'd been drinking and laughing into the late hours when Martin decided to step outside for a smoke break. I didn't smoke but decided to join him for some fresh air due to the dizzying mix of tobacco smell and squeaky F-sharps from the drunken wannabe singer trying his best to ruin, come together. Kyle opted to stick around inside the bar. It felt outstanding out on that empty dirt road, like there was an eerie presence in the air that danced alongside every blustering breeze. In between inhales, Martin casually mentioned he had heard rumors about unknown creatures stalking this area at night. Man, you've been listening to too many campfire stories. I chuckled nervously, trying not to give credence to these vague claims and steady my own imagination. Martin insensitively barked back some slurred curse words targeting my weak demeanor then flicked his barely smoked cigarette into the darkness before sauntering back inside. With one last cautious eye toward the unsettling black void of old Route 89, I reluctantly followed him in. It wasn't much later when we left what was left of our inebriated sanity at the bar and stumbled out of the creaky front door. That's when the real night of terror began. We made our way toward Kyle's old pickup only to find him sprawled limp on the ground with deep gash marks on his arms and legs. I could only imagine what horrific event had unfolded while Martin and I were drunkenly bickering away inside. The panic-stricken look emblazoned on Kyle's ghostly white face was unmistakable. Drenched in confusion, Martin and I loaded him into the back of the truck, scrambling to escape this anomalous occurrence. As Martin tried to start the engine futilely, each desperate turn of the key echoed a hollow screech, and we found out the spark plugs were ripped apart. Suddenly, a gut-wrenching roar reverberated throughout the night air, low-pitched yet otherworldly. What in the hell was that? Martin panted out, his eyes wide with fear. Warm breath fogged my own trembling hands clutching my engineer's sidearm as an ungodly creature emerged from shadowy recesses. Towering over us with elongated limbs and claws dripping in Kyle's blood, it suddenly dawned on me. This was a Yinald Lushiet, a skinwalker from native folklore. Unpredictable and malevolent by nature, this disturbing fiend was now hunting us down. By some miracle or blind luck, I managed to restart Martin's truck just as that monstrous figure lunged toward us. Squealing tires barely gripped rough terrain as we floored the gas pedal away from those hellish grasping claws. Piecing together fragmented speculations days later after confessing our nightmare to elders, we learned that a man holding deep grudges against our tribe had sought retribution by performing ancient rituals to invoke such a vile being. So, here I sit now, recounting those chilling events that have scarred every ounce of me. I can't shake the feeling of being watched as we mourn for our fallen comrade Kyle. But what haunts me most is the uncertainty of who, or what, lingers in our unspoken fears lurking just beyond the darkness. Since that harrowing night, our once tightly knit little group has begun to unravel. Martin, 
racked with guilt over Kyle's death, began losing himself to the bottle and driving away our shared friends with his erratic behavior. As for me, the nightmares replay unrelentingly, stealing my peace of mind every time I close my eyes. I often find myself driving aimlessly through the backroads of Casper late at night, desperate to catch a glimpse of that monstrous being, whether to confirm the reality of what happened or in some insane attempt at retribution. The whispers around town have turned from harmless tales to warnings of the malevolent force we now know is real, still lurking in the darkness that surrounds us all. I've dedicated nearly every waking hour to researching Native American lore and seeking advice from tribal elders, some willing to help, others too guarded or fearful of divulging forbidden knowledge. Gradually, I've started uncovering clues about rituals and methods known to repel or even destroy skinwalkers like the one who took our friend. In the darkest corners of my mind lies an uneasy resolution. I must face this creature and reclaim the shattered fragments of our lives. Armed with ancient wisdom and steely resolve, Martin and I prepare ourselves for a showdown at the heart of this evil presence. Our bond has strengthened as each piece falls into place, transforming us into warriors on a mission, not only to honor Kyle's memory but also for the safety and peace of mind of all those we hold dear. As dusk turns to twilight on yet another restless night in Casper, Martin and I head toward what might very well be our final stand words remain unspoken as we pull onto Old Route 89. Fears and doubts hang heavy in the air like fog settling over a graveyard. Time stands still as we reach our destination, baiting out whatever horror lies in wait with bated breath. I grip my engineer's sidearm tightly my hands trembling with the weight of the choice before me. The wind howls menacingly, carrying whispers of the past and cries of an unknown future. Answers and salvation lie mere moments away, but we have no certainty of success. Despite everything, we stand united against the darkness, ready to face whatever twisted abominations may crawl from its depths. It was one of those small towns in the U.S. where everyone knows everyone. My name is Wyatt Gray Wolf, a proud Cheyenne American native living a quiet life in Somerset, Colorado. That day started just like any other. I was stocking shelves at the local hardware store when Ray, my coworker and childhood friend, came up to me with an unusual story. Hey Wyatt, did you hear about Dale's cattle? He said he found one of them torn apart and mutilated this morning. Ray whispered in a hushed tone. I furrowed my brow, unsure whether to believe him or not. Dale could have a vivid imagination sometimes. No way. It must be a pack of coyotes or something. I replied, brushing it off as nonsense. After all, strange things can happen on farms from time to time. Nevertheless, as the days went by, more reports of mutilated animals began to surface, not only cows but also horses and other livestock. And it wasn't just in our area. The neighboring towns were experiencing the same strange occurrences that made no logical sense. I remember walking home from work one evening when I caught sight of something in the woods near my house. At first glance, it appeared to be an animal, an incredibly large one, hunched over the body of yet another victim. The creature stood up on two legs and stared right at me with glowing eyes before disappearing into the trees. Just like that, word began to spread that it wasn't just animals meeting their demise anymore. People were going missing too, all over Somerset County. Empty cars found abandoned near the woods seemed to be the only trace left behind. The local sheriff organized search parties consisting of concerned citizens and police officers to go deep into the forests surrounding our town, 
but every time they return empty-handed with only more questions than answers. It wasn't until I stumbled upon old newspaper clippings at the town's library that I learned about the fearsome creature known as the Ahul, a monstrous bat-like entity from Native American folklore. The name sent chills down my spine, a coinciding sense of familiarity and dread. One late night, Adam, our curious and reckless friend, urged us to venture into the woods looking to expose the truth behind these gruesome attacks. Six of us, including Ray and me, agreed to join him with the utmost skepticism in tow. We traversed deeper into the woods until we reached a clearing that was ominously quiet and disconcerting. At that moment, the blood-curdling screech of the monstrous ahole echoed between the trees, paralyzing us with fear. It emerged from the shadows with enormous wings stretched out and razor-sharp claws that could easily tear through flesh like paper. Its hideous face resembled a disfigured human's, filled with hunger and hatred for all living things. In a split second, Adam was snatched from our midst, his screams quickly silenced by the demonic screech of our winged assailant. We ran like hell as fast as our legs could carry us but not everyone made it out and scathed. Days after our harrowing ordeal, survivors in town bore secrets of their encounters with the Ahul until one unfortunate soul came forward to share their story in full, devastating detail. We were grateful to have escaped with our lives but lived in constant fear of what had been awakened deep within those woods. It took years to piece together my understanding of what happened back then. Some would say it was just popular imagination gone wild, the effects of mass hysteria taking hold of a small, secluded town. But I can't shake off what I saw that day. Now and then, when I close my eyes at night, I still see those glowing orbs staring back at me and wonder if I'll ever be rid of the fear haunting me every waking moment. Years have passed since those terrifying events, and yet their memory lingers in the minds of Somerset's residents. A quiet unease hangs over the town like a dark cloud, and whispers of the Ahole still pass from one generation to another. After that fateful encounter, some of us tried to cope with what we had witnessed by seeking solace in our community, while others moved away in search of peace and safety far from Somerset's dreadful secret. Ray and I have remained close friends, acknowledging both our shared trauma and a connection to those who were lost. We've all tried to regain some semblance of normalcy, rebuilding our lives while haunted by the shadows lurking just beyond our peripheral vision. Each year, on the anniversary of our spine-chilling encounter with the Ahul, those who had been present in the woods gather for a private remembrance. It's our way of honoring the victims who were taken too soon and reinforcing our bond as survivors. And though we all try to suppress the fear that there might come a day when we once again hear that monstrous screech in the night, it becomes increasingly difficult as reports from other towns begin to surface detailing similar encounters. As time goes by, Ray and I can't help but wonder if we may have played a part in unleashing this ancient terror upon the world. With each passing year, more people have gathered the courage to come forward with their own stories and accounts involving mysterious creatures, both winged monsters akin to a hull and others with their own sinister appearances. This increase in sightings has driven me into research mode unearthing old texts filled with folklore about ancient beings that once haunted the land and were potentially resurrected by unknown forces. The sense of responsibility weighs heavily upon my heart as I strive to understand this new darkness casting its shadow upon Somerset County. And now, as I sit here writing my thoughts in hopes of finding answers or perhaps even resolution, I can only wonder when the next horrifying encounter will occur, not just in our town but elsewhere too. Because the one thing I've learned from that frightful ordeal is that these creatures don't stay contained within the boundaries of Somerset. They move like whispers in the wind, 
spreading terror and death to those unfortunate enough to cross their path. I can't shake the feeling that something's off as I walk into Sullivan's bar on that cold November night. It's around 8 p.m., and the place is almost deserted. The dimly lit room seems to swallow any sound, creating an eerie silence. I'm Apollo Takoda, a 28-year-old Cheyenne native, and I've been living in this small rural town in Wyoming my whole life. As I take a seat at the bar, Old Hank Sullivan, the owner, hands me a beer with a nod. We've been friends for years, but there's something odd about him tonight. He looks worn out and scared. Rough day? I ask. You have no idea, Hank mumbles. Out of nowhere, Carly Matthews sits next to me with her usual sparkling smile. A local rancher in this tight-knit community, She's always had my back whenever things got rough. Hey, Apollo. Have you heard the stories about those mutilated cows over near old man Jenkins' farm? Carly asks. You're kidding me. Hank interjects before I can say anything. Don't tell me you actually believe that nonsense. Our conversations then take a more lighthearted turn, and we all share a good laugh. Over the next several days, however, the mood around town grows increasingly tense, and whispers of strange mutilations continue to circulate. But being the skeptics we are, me included, no one pays those rumors much mind. Late one evening, after having a few drinks at Sullivan's Bar with Carly and some others from around town, I headed home alone. As I turn onto an isolated dirt road leading to my house, something powerful slams into the side of my truck. Reeling from the shock and being terrified out of my mind, with adrenaline flooding my veins like never before, I floored the gas pedal, hoping to get away from whatever that was. I could feel the tires in the back kicking up dirt. Did something rip one right off of my truck? Suddenly. My truck comes to a screeching halt. I look around frantically, and through my shattered window, I spot a grotesque creature with massive horns and glowing red eyes. My heart thunders in my chest as I clench the steering wheel, trying to gather my thoughts. What the hell is this thing? Is this one of those creatures from American native folklore nobody really takes seriously? Realizing that staying in the truck is not an option, I spring out of it and sprint to Carly's nearby ranch. As I force open her door, gasping for air and trying to form coherent words, Carly stares at me with wide eyes. Apollo! What happened? she asks. After catching my breath, all I manage to explain between panic sobs is that there's something out there and it tried to kill me. Carly urges me to stay at her place for the night so we can figure things out in the morning. The next day, we hear on the news that multiple other locals have now vanished without a trace. Panic grips us as we realize this isn't just our imaginations running wild. The truth dawns upon us. There's a menace terrorizing our town straight out of an ancient legend. Over time, Fear gives way to determination as Carly and I vow to find answers. We spend countless hours researching ancient folklore and speaking with tribal elders who reluctantly share stories that further convince us that there is indeed a monstrous creature among us, driven by an insatiable appetite for blood, Nahani Bobani. Although rumors abound about sightings and ghastly attacks by Nahani Bobani, Peace eventually returns to our small community, but not for long. A few weeks later, Hank confides in me that he'd heard about the creature long before I encountered it. A fellow Native American traveler who passed through town years ago shared Nahani Bobani's legend and warned that if provoked, it would enact unspeakable horrors. 
Hank finally reveals that his worn-out demeanor from that first night in the bar stemmed from fear. The mutilations had begun, and he knew what was coming. But by then, it was already too late. As the sun sets behind jagged mountains, Carly and I have no choice but to accept the chilling truth. Nahani Bobani will stalk these lands relentlessly, like an ancient wound refusing to heal, forever casting a grim shadow over our once peaceful town. We decide that we cannot let the nightmare continue to plague our lives. With newfound resolve, Carly and I embark on a treacherous mission to confront the Nahani Bobani and save our community from their ceaseless terror. Venturing deep into the surrounding wilderness, armed with little more than our courage, knowledge of ancient folklore, and a handful of protective charms passed down by our ancestors, we face the unknown head-on. Days turn into weeks, and we become more desperate as the creature remains elusive. Through relentless pursuit combined with our determination to end this nightmare, we finally corner Nahani Bobani in a desolate cave on a moonlit night. Aware that there may be only one chance to vanquish this malevolent being, Carly and I embrace each other one last time before performing an ancient Cheyenne ritual passed down by tribal elders. As the ceremony draws to a close, a great wave of energy envelopes us, resonating with our utter conviction to protect our family and friends back home. The beast snarls in defiance as it senses its demise. Nevertheless, it is powerless against the sacred bonds that now encircle its grotesque form. As morning breaks, the haunting wails of Nahani Bobani echo through the air before finally fading away. Our ordeal is over, yet we know this hard-won victory will forever color our lives and change how we view our world. As we make our way back home, the memory of Nahani Bobani lingers like an unseen shroud, a harrowing reminder of how fragile the boundaries between myth and reality can be when darkness threatens to consume all that we hold dear. I still remember the day it all began like it was permanently etched into my brain. It was October 4, 2010, and I was visiting my cousin Darren at his cabin just outside Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm Akachita Smith, both Cheyenne and a criminal defense attorney, while Darren is a local reporter who loves exploring obscure stories in our state. Back then, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. That evening started out innocently enough. We cracked open a few beers and caught up on each other's lives, completely oblivious to the harrowing events that would soon unfold. As we sat on the porch overlooking an expansive forest, Darren started to discuss some of the recent unsolved crimes that had captured his interest, a string of bizarre occurrences he was investigating for his newspaper. As he told me about some audacious break-ins with unexplainable details, I remember feeling slightly uneasy. It seemed inexplicable and stranger than most reports I heard of. In the midst of our conversation, we heard rustling in the underbrush nearby. Figuring it was just a deer or other small animal, we brushed it off and continued chatting. Over the next couple of hours, the night darkened around us but the eeriness only intensified. Gradually, unsettling noises permeated through the trees, strange howls and inhuman screeches that neither of us could identify. Darren was growing more apprehensive by the moment. His eyes widened as he shared a disturbing instance where locals near Pine Top Lakeside discovered an inexplicably slaughtered deer beyond any animal's capability. The unease transformed into an adrenaline surge when suddenly something violently slammed against the cabin wall from inside. Feeling responsible for Darren's safety too, I mustered courage, and we hesitantly moved together towards the sound source, a locked room at one end of the cabin. 
What we saw when we finally forced the door open is forever imprinted in my mind. The room looked as if a hurricane had torn through it. It didn't make sense. Nobody else was up here with us. How could this have happened? We called the police, who arrived to find nothing missing. They dismissed it as an act of vandalism, despite acknowledging that someone would be hard-pressed to enter a locked room. Overwhelmed by confusion, Darren sought help from a contact he had made over years of reporting, a Navajo shaman named Nora Begay who lived nearby. Nora patiently listened to Darren recount our experiences and divulge the dark origins of a malevolent species called skinwalkers. In Native American folklore, skinwalkers are supernatural beings that can shape, shift, and possess animals, or even humans for evil purposes. The legend terrified us, but their presence explained the inexplicable occurrences we were witnessing. The following day, more mischief ensued. Tire tracks surrounding the cabin that matched no vehicle either of us owned, and an odd smell. Desperation compelled us to confront our fears and seek out Nora for help. Nora advised conducting a simple cleansing ceremony around the cabin's perimeter to ward off darkness. She performed the ritual herself, ensuring that all appropriate measures were taken to protect us and our space. Tentatively, we spent another night at the cabin while keeping every weapon within reach. The evening passed quietly without any disturbance. At dawn, though, two officers came knocking with recent photos they discovered in their systems. Photos of unidentified footprints found at various crime scenes in Flagstaff shocking us with their similarities to the tracks around our cabin. The cops debunked our theory about the skinwalker's existence, but its presence was never completely ruled out. The crimes in town remain unsolved to this day. Victims hope for justice while secretly dreading a supernatural explanation behind their misery. Years later, reality has triumphed over folklore, but despite the rationality of my profession, Sometimes I still can't shake off the dread looming in the shadows. In my heart, I wonder, was it a clever criminal or an elusive skinwalker that tormented us that fateful night? The years have gone by, and both Darren and I have carried on with our lives, albeit forever changed by that chilling encounter. We've formed a sort of unspoken bond due to our shared experience, and though we may not discuss it openly, the memories continue to haunt us. Since that incident, our interests have expanded beyond the confines of our respective career paths. We've grown to indulge in curious tales of the supernatural and unspoken accounts that breathe life into the enigmatic shadows of history. Underneath the actions of seemingly ordinary people and inexplicable events, we continue searching for clues in hopes of discovering answers to questions that were never asked. Whether it's exploring ancient cultures or deciphering cryptic symbols along forgotten paths, we find solace in unraveling the mysteries veiled by time. The thrill of discovery sharpens our senses and fuels long-buried desires to uncover secrets known to only a few. As for me, my profession as a criminal defense attorney has taken on new dimensions. I now view each case through a lens tinted with intrigue and wonder. I seek resolutions for my clients that go beyond mere legal victories, ones that provide them with peace of mind from the inexplicable traumas they've encountered. And so, as Darren delves deeper into his journalistic pursuits, shedding light on lost legends and local folklore, we find validation for our shared experiences in others who have witnessed the unknown. Although there may never be definitive answers or concrete evidence for things like the Skinwalker legend, we remain steadfast in our pursuit of unmasking what lurks in the realm of shadows. The stars have aligned, forming an unbreakable connection between us that transcends time itself. Together, we tread along a path darkened by uncertainty but illuminated by the hope that someday we might uncover the truth behind that dreaded night so many years ago, 
whether it's finally finding mundane evidence or confirming our darkest suspicions about the supernatural. Until that day comes, we march forward towards the unknown, driven by an insatiable curiosity and lingering dread that refuses to fade into oblivion. It was the summer of 2001, and I had just moved to a small rural town in Wyoming to start a teaching job at the local high school. The town was nothing special, just your typical tight-knit community with friendly faces all around. As a Cheyenne native, I appreciated the slow pace away from the hustle and bustle of city life. It wasn't until my third week that things started to take a turn for the unexpected. My colleague, Danica Khalil, and I decided to host a little get-together for our fellow teachers. The party went on late into the night, and everyone seemed to enjoy themselves. It was around midnight, when we were finally tidying up, that we received word that one of our students, Samuel Taylor, had gone missing while biking home after swim practice earlier that evening. Concerned citizens organized search parties in no time. I felt obligated to help out, so I joined Danica and Principal Hargrove in the search. As we walked through the dimly lit streets, shadows danced on the walls of abandoned buildings, casting an eerie atmosphere that you couldn't shake off. The evening turned into night with no sign of young Samuel. The search party split up with walkie-talkies and continued combing near the forest as Danica and I stayed closer to town. Suddenly, one member of the search party frantically called in over our walkie-talkies. He'd found something down by the lake's edge. When we arrived at the scene, it was clear this scene wouldn't leave our minds any time soon. What lay before us was something straight out of a nightmare. Samuel's mangled bike twisted beyond recognition. And there he was, poor Sam, lifeless, his body torn apart as if savaged by some monstrous beast. The sight was too much. Danica ran off sobbing, while Principal Hargrove vomited behind a nearby tree, and the voices of my other colleagues cracked through the walkie-talkies in disbelief. The local authorities, pressured into giving answers, declared it was a wild animal attack, case closed. But something about that just seemed too convenient. Over the following weeks, a palpable unease settled upon our town. Then, one day over lunch, Danica told me something that made my blood run cold. Her mother, an elder in the community, shared stories of the Athanka, an ancient mythical creature with an insatiable hunger for human souls. This creature had been rumored to stalk the dense forests surrounding the village for centuries. The next few months were unbearable. Five more people vanished or were found savagely attacked. Every scream heard in daylight or during dark nights only added to our fears. Rumors spread like wildfire pointing fingers at possible culprits. Adolescent pranks escalated into full-fledged paranoia riots. Feeling confined by dread and fear within the town's limits, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I sought help from a couple of locals familiar with tracking skills, ex-Marine Mason Stevens and park ranger Leslie Sullivan. Together, we ventured deep into the forest, determined to solve this mystery, no matter how dangerous it turned out to be. After days of cautiously following tracks and strange scratches on trees, we stumbled upon something peculiar, only described as an ancient burial site long forgotten by time itself. A crude altar stood at its center, adorned with human skulls and bones. Before we could comprehend what was happening, an air-splitting roar echoed through the woods as if summoned by our intrusion. We bolted back for town as fast as we could, hearts pounding like drums in our chests. We never clearly saw whatever it was that pursued us through the woods that day. 
According to Mason's account during debriefing at the local police station, the creature appeared like a horrifying mixture of a human and a bear, but with an impossibly large stature. The police dismissed them as stress-induced hallucinations and refused to dig into them any further. The only comfort we found was in those twisted ancient myths about Athanka that suddenly seemed much too close to reality. That was the last time we ever saw the creature, or anything like it again, though the terror refuses to leave. The community grieved its losses in silent resignation, unable to come to terms with the unknown fate forced upon them. Danica moved away a few years later, and our once innocent hometown has never fully recovered from the scars those events left behind. People still talk about the mysterious Athanka legend in hushed tones, wary of the possibility that such darkness could return at any moment. I continued my work as a teacher, trying to instill hope and inspiration in my students despite being haunted by memories that would never fade. Instead of letting fear consume me, I focused on harnessing my strength and resolve to protect those around me. In time, the raw terror shifted to a more subdued vigilance, and life went on in our small town. However, the whispers of the past never truly disappeared. They lingered on just beneath the surface, a chilling reminder of what once walked among us and an ever-present warning for future generations to heed. I never thought I'd be the kind of person to have a story like this, but here I am. My name is Kaya Soaring Eagle, and I'm originally from the Cheyenne Nation. A few years ago, I found myself in an eerie place called Blackwater Creek, right here in the United States. It was a small town that seemed to have an unsettling vibe to it, something just felt off about the place. However, as far as anyone knew, Nothing out of the ordinary had ever happened there. At least no one wanted to talk about it. A little background on me. I'm a freelance journalist who has always been fascinated by small, offbeat towns that have an air of mystery surrounding them. So when I stumbled upon Blackwater Creek, it piqued my interest like nothing before. As I spent some time in town, interviewing locals and learning its history, everything appeared rather innocuous. Sure, there were whispers of strange happenings in the woods surrounding Blackwater Creek, but it was easy to chalk most of them up to urban legends or overactive imaginations. I was staying with a family who ran in and located just outside the main part of town. The McAllisters were friendly folk, easy to get along with, and quick with a laugh despite living under this eerie umbrella for so long. One afternoon over lunch, I couldn't help but feel that any mention of strange occurrences was laughed off too quickly, something they'd become skilled at keeping under wraps. What piqued my curiosity even further was when young Annie McAllister mentioned she'd seen shadowy figures lurking in the forest at night. Her father quickly dismissed her claims as nothing more than silly childhood fantasies, but she insisted they weren't humans and had a haunting gaze that reached into her soul. As a logical skeptic myself, it would have been easy to dismiss Annie's claims as mere imagination run wild. But there was something about the fear in her eyes that gave me pause. Over the next few days, things started to escalate in Blackwater Creek, from stolen livestock to vandalized personal property. The town's atmosphere grew increasingly tense as everyone debated who was responsible for these incidents. One evening, in a hushed conversation over several whiskey shots at the local bar, I met a man who claimed to have information regarding the true nature of these occurrences. He introduced himself as Ray Huntsman, a rugged and visibly skeptical old-timer. According to him, some thought these incidents were linked to an ancient Native American creature called the Wendigo, a cannibalistic monster that could possess humans and control their actions. 
As much as I was intrigued by this idea, I couldn't help but feel skeptical. That was until a series of violent attacks shook Blackwater Creek. People were found mutilated on the outskirts of town, separated limbs scattered across the nearby woods. The town went into an uproar. Nobody felt safe anymore. Everybody locked themselves within their homes in utter fear. It was soon after this that I decided I needed to have a talk with Ray again. He confided more about what he knew about the Wendigo and how he believed it somehow found its way into Blackwater Creek. The creature had become bold in recent days, attacking families in broad daylight and causing pure, unmitigated terror in this small community. The whole town felt like it was on the brink of madness. Based on Ray's information and my own investigations, I slowly started putting together evidence linking this malevolent being to the bizarre events that had befallen Blackwater Creek. The final piece of this chilling puzzle came when Annie went missing from her home one evening. Despite extensive searches, no trace of her could be found, as if swallowed by the woods surrounding her innocent forested domain. As darkness closed in around the edges of Blackwater Creek, the town seemed to be lost, a mystery that would fall into the annals of cold cases. It was only then that I realized the enormity of the creature we were dealing with. It was powerful, enigmatic, and deadly, leaving little chance for us to ever find Annie or truly understand what had awakened this terrifying monster. But there are some creatures in this world whose origins and motives are forever shrouded in darkness. And sometimes, all that's left after the dust settles are whispers and stories. Echoes of those who encountered evil in its rawest form and survived to share their tale. With a heavy heart, I decided it was time for me to leave Blackwater Creek, knowing that my continued presence there could only bring more pain and suffering to the frightened townsfolk. Despite my journalistic instincts urging me to stay and try to uncover the full truth, I knew that some mysteries were better left untold. As I packed my bags and said my farewells to the McAllister family, promising to keep in touch and continue searching for answers on my own, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched, that the dark force we had unknowingly unleashed on Blackwater Creek was haunting me. Every shadow seemed to hide a sinister secret, and every rustle of leaves brought forth chilling memories of the horrors we had all witnessed. The town of Blackwater Creek may have been cursed by an ancient evil whose origin and motives remain an enigma, but its people have shown me just how resilient the human spirit can be when faced with adversity. They had chosen to stand together in times of darkness and devastation forging bonds that no horror could break. And as I drove away from that lonely, haunted town, I realized that if there was one thing this experience had taught me, it was that even amidst unimaginable terror, there is still hope. Hope for understanding, hope for redemption, and hope for a brighter future. It was around 11 p.m. on that fateful Tuesday night when I ventured out to grab some snacks from the 24-hour convenience store just a block away from my apartment. The whole neighborhood was eerily quiet, not your regular kind of silence. This was in mid-October 2015, and I was living in the small town of Silver Lake, Oregon. As a Cheyenne American native myself, I moved here nearly two years ago for a fresh start. My name is Calden Ironcloud, a former police officer who resigned after seeing some dreadful things during his tenure with the force. Black hair tied back in a bun, tattoos adorned my arms, and most people wouldn't want to mess around with someone of my frame. Meeting friends at the local bar that Saturday night took an unexpected turn when Azalea Reed whose husband owned the place, mentioned hearing some strange sounds near her house while walking her dog earlier in the week. 
She brushed it off as just some animal, or maybe their overprotective neighbor growling about property limits again. It became an inside joke among us. We did enjoy those silly moments. Fast forward to that Tuesday night when the roller shutter on the store was halfway down and Tim, the storekeeper, stood leaning against it, smoking. We said our usual hellos and family updates before I apologized for interrupting his break. Just then, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the air from several blocks away. What the hell? Tim muttered under his breath. Without even thinking twice, I ran towards the source of that spine-chilling sound. The world turned on its head when I saw Dana Larson, a young woman who lived in my apartment complex and worked at a nearby office, laying on the ground in an unnatural position under inconceivable torment. I stifled a gasp when I saw what looked like fresh claw marks sunken deep into her flesh, eyes wide and face white as a sheet. Whatever attacked her had ripped her apart. Gathering my senses, I radioed for an ambulance, but it was too late. Her life had faded away right in front of me. We felt sick to the core. We were at a loss, as the police reports came up with nothing concrete. Over the next few days, everyone was on high alert, divided between fear and disbelief. It was Azalea who stumbled upon a gruesome lead. Rummaging through the old files of the bar, she saw a small, battered newspaper article from the 80s mentioning Melissa Cheeto, or Shadow Eater, a creature terrifyingly similar to the one we suspected from Dana's mauling. Based on the eyewitness reports, this creature preyed on loneliness and darkness, leading them to believe in its existence and actions. More thorough research informed us that Nalusa Chito has been haunting Cheyenne natives for generations. Although it chilled my blood, I assembled a group with Tim and Azalea, determined not to let this monster elude us any further, even though, truthfully, none of us knew exactly what we were up against. Several nights of anxious patrol ensued but yielded nothing but frayed nerves and swirling doubts. Our fears briefly dissolved when the elusive creature appeared in person, or rather, as a beast, on one terrifying moonless night. Spotting it from afar, Azalea went pale as all our suspicions were backed by reality. Tim Calden, that's him. Standing near its chosen victim, Nancy Jackson from down the block, was the elusive Nalissa Cheeto. As we sprinted towards them, time slowed, the stifling silence starkly contrasted by how Nancy's screams shattered our souls. Before we could launch a proper offensive, the creature dissolved into thin air with an ear-cringing screech, leaving behind another ravaged body and her wailing family, drawn by grievous hollers. It was only by chance that I later overheard hushed discussions with distraught officers at the precinct. The Nalissa Cheeto stayed hidden from us until cruelly entwined with our fear, he chose to reveal himself as a mystery that terrorized the town and persisted through the years to come. In the wake of these horrifying incidents, Silver Lake was a shell of its former self. Fear ran rampant through the streets, and residents hesitated to step outside their homes after sundown. With the Nalusa Cheeto haunting our shadows, it seemed as if the tranquility we craved was nothing more than a distant dream. As weeks passed, more gruesome encounters piled on, with victims falling prey to the creature's deadly allure. Our team's attempts to capture or kill the monster proved futile time and again. The Nalissa Cheeto always seemed one step ahead of our plans. The psychological toll of chasing this nightmarish presence began to take its toll on us all. The nights grew longer as we spent more time patrolling and tracking sightings, pushing the limits of fatigue to near breaking point, yet fate wasn't done testing us. As tensions escalated within our group, Azalea's husband Buck received a desperate call from their daughter, who, hearing strange noises behind her from their woods, fled into the night only to have her own world collapse around her. 
her friend Casey lay slaughtered feet away from her residence. With heavy hearts, we vowed it would be the last tragedy caused by Nalissa Cheeto. Its reign must end before more lives shatter beneath its gruesome claws. The palpable fear that gripped Silver Lake only served to fuel the monster's power. We knew that breaking this sinister cycle somehow lay in reclaiming control over our ancient terror. Racing against despair's clock, it was then that we dusted off ancestral tales and lore, like desperate souls combing tidal shores for pearls, searching for any wisdom buried in forgotten corners. It was in these fragile threads of hope that we stumbled upon an ancient song, a chant that had once held refuge for generations terrified by what lurked behind the veil of darkness. Echoed by shimmering firelight against woven birch huts on plains long ago, the power of this chant may very well be the weapon we need to confront and destroy Nalissa Cheeto. Armed with this newfound knowledge, we banded together in our final stand against the relentless predator, resolve crackling like a wildfire through us. It would be on this last moonless night that we would finally face our deepest nightmare in order to restore peace and hopefully recapture the sense of safety that Silver Lake had long lost. I had just finished my night shift at the old factory, feeling pretty exhausted. The sky above me seemed darker than usual as I walked along the familiar dirt path behind the old warehouse. As a Cheyenne American native, I'd always felt a special connection to the desolate but peaceful landscapes I found myself in. Here in Wyoming, away from the hustle of city life, it was easy to embrace the quiet serenity that surrounded me. My name is Rain Weaselhorse, and for as long as I could remember, I resided in this secluded part of the U.S. Though my parents passed away when I was young, my uncle, Stone Fox, looked after me, teaching me survival skills and sharing stories of our ancient heritage. He was a highly regarded member of our tribe. As I continued on my path home that eerie night, the dry leaves crackled underfoot while various insects buzzed in the cool air. An unsettling feeling crept its way into my chest, something felt off. Though there had been no indication of trouble around these parts recently, nor had there been any rumors about anything nefarious lurking nearby, my instincts spoke otherwise. I arrived home to find Jonah Starbuck my best friend and roommate, scratching his head in confusion over a concerning piece of news he'd come across. Rain, Jonah said uneasily as he handed over a local newspaper article reporting instances of missing people from neighboring towns. We should stay alert. He cautioned as we stayed up late into the night discussing our concerns. The next day was seemingly ordinary. We double-checked our security measures but otherwise went about our normal lives. Little did we know that life as we knew it was slipping away with each passing moment. One late evening, while hanging out with a group of friends at a local bar, Eddie Pike's Saloon and Midpoint Cafe, Jonah took things further by sharing our paranoia about recent events. As he did so, I noticed our conversation was being closely observed by a solemn older man named Clarence Buckskin. When Clarence approached us later, Jonah and I were skeptical. But he revealed himself to be an elder from another tribe, and though his words carried a serious tone, they felt familiar enough to listen to his chilling tale. Clarence spoke of an ancient supernatural being called the Skinwalker said to be an evil which capable of transforming into any animal or even other people just by locking eyes with its prey. At first glance, Skinwalker might appear to be an urban legend weaved by the elders of our community, but the alarming nature of this entity was only made more plausible when Clarence revealed that these creatures had been stalking towns like ours, and their attacks were responsible for the recent disappearances. 
Though we were skeptical of the legend, something about the dead seriousness in Clarence's eyes made our gut feelings intensify. And it was only when a dear mutual friend, Sammy Dickinson, vanished one night after getting back from work that we knew Clarence had spoken the truth. Sammy's disappearance shook everyone in our little community. Looking for answers and seeking vengeance against whatever stole him from us, Jonah and I soon found ourselves caught up in a dark world we never knew existed. Following a trail of horrific crime scenes and gruesome details that could have only been left behind by something not human, we found more intricate evidence pointing towards Skinwalker. Our previously peaceful lives were now engulfed in chaos as we fought against time to find the creature behind these sinister acts. Harrowing encounters with twisted creatures shape-shifting their way out of sight left us even more convinced that Skinwalker truly prowled among us. By some miracle, Jonah and I managed to survive Skinwalker's attacks and ultimately found Sammy, alive but traumatized beyond recognition. Through gritted teeth and unrelenting persistence, we managed to flush out the malicious creature that had taken so much from us. The showdown with the creature ended in a bloody confrontation, leaving everyone on edge and unsure of what Skinwalker had planned next. Days passed before we heard of more attacks happening miles away, which were linked to Skinwalker. Though Jonah and I wished for closure that never came, we knew that what we faced possessed a supernatural ability unparalleled by anything we had ever encountered before. With heavy hearts, we resumed our lives, forever changed and haunted by the memories of our recent past. The spirits of our ancestors seemed to linger in the air, as if to remind us of their own battles against such malevolence. Jonah and I found solace in sharing our experiences with others who had been touched by the darkness, forming a close-knit group of warriors sworn to protect our people from supernatural threats. We began to train rigorously, learning ancient rituals and techniques bestowed upon us by Clarence and other tribal elders, in hopes of preventing further atrocities committed by skinwalkers or beings like them. Our lives took a new course with a newfound sense of purpose, forged through the crucible of hardship and loss. Together, we fought for justice in an ever-shifting world where shadows harbored unspeakable terrors and the line between the natural and supernatural blurred beyond recognition. The legacy of Rain Weasel Horse and Jonah Starbuck would go on to be more than just a tale of survival. It would become a symbol of resilience for generations to come, an eternal reminder that even in the darkest moments, hope could still prevail. I leaned against the railing of my apartment's small balcony, overlooking the town of Sheridan, Wyoming. The normally bustling street below seemed unusually quiet tonight. My watch buzzed to inform me that it was well past midnight, and I shook my head, realizing I'd lost track of time yet again. The name is Keelan Johnson, by the way. I'm a Cheyenne native who grew up on the reservations before coming to this part of the state in search of better prospects. Until recently, I'd been working as a handyman around town, fixing cars, patching up roofs, you know, odd jobs. But solid work has been harder to come by as of late. So when an old buddy of mine, Dean Windriver, called and mentioned he needed help fixing up a cabin he'd inherited in the nearby Bighorn Mountains, I jumped at the opportunity without hesitation. Dean picked me up early the next day in his beat-up truck, with an Afghan hound named Rocco hanging lazily out the back window, and we started on our journey into the mountains. We laughed and reminisced about the old days while Rocco drooled around us. We arrived at the cabin around noon. It was clearly in disrepair, but nestled within a lush forest with blooming wildflowers and distant mountain peaks, it formed a picture-perfect backdrop. 
We got to work immediately, stripping off old paint, replacing warped boards, and installing new windows. Meanwhile, Dean's wife, Alma, prepared hearty meals for us each day once she got off her shift at the local diner in town. Days passed. Occasionally, when we were outdoors during the evening hours, we noticed dead animals, rabbits or squirrels, just lying there as if something had snatched life out of them suddenly but left them unharmed otherwise, aside from missing eyes or tongues. Unsettling incidents increased by playing with my subconscious warning alarms, but I brushed them off as wild animal activity, although I knew there were odd patterns we couldn't quite explain. A week later, however, everything changed. We were taking a short break when we heard Alma shout from inside the cabin, her words difficult to discern but her voice frantic and high-pitched with fear. We rushed in and found her hunched over a table, breathing heavily, staring wide-eyed at a strange symbol smeared across the tabletop in scratches, not just on the surface but into its dark grains mixed with an unknown and odorous fluid. Confused and alarmed, we convinced Alma to explain what had made her react the way she did. She stumbled over her words but told us that this symbol was associated with obscure Native American folklore. It represented the Michigaraguay, a primitive beast known for causing inexplicable destruction to those who encountered it. After seeing the symbol and hearing Alma's story, we all stopped laughing. Dean decided to pack up his wife and Rocco to head back to town, where they'd stay at their cousin's place for safety while we finished working on the cabin. He dropped them off in town and returned late in the evening with news of more dead animals found around their house that day during sunset hours. With each passing moment, our skepticism seemed to slip away like smoke through our trembling fingers. Dean shrugged off his fear justifying it as weirdly targeted pranks by bored local teenagers. After an uneasy night's rest, we got back to work, brushing our concerns aside despite churning guts screaming uneasy sensations every so often when darkness engulfed the horizon, bruising the mesmerizing cloak of sunset with a hint of dread. It was as the shadows lengthened into twilight that everything finally came crashing down upon us. Without warning, a blood-chilling roar rattled our very bones, unearthly, savage, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. One could almost taste despair fermenting in the air. My blood turned ice cold as a monstrous figure emerged from the tangled brush, bearing the same twisted symbol etched onto its grayish, feral features. Michigaraguay had awakened to reality and not just figures displayed on pages of history, it seemed. Dean and I stared, paralyzed, witnessing the beast charge forward, leaving in its wake shattered tree limbs and gouged earth. It laid siege to our handiwork, obliterating the cabin and showing us simultaneously that the strength of the fragile human physique is no match for the brute force with which it was dismantling every wooden chip. We fought against our instincts to stay rooted in place, sprinting for our lives into the dark forest with only the sound of our ragged breaths and pounding hearts breaking the eerie silence. We barely managed to evade the beast's wrath, but in doing so, we found ourselves lost in the wilderness, shivering and disoriented. There, under a moonless night sky, we huddled together for warmth, our thoughts a turbulent storm of regret, fear, and desperation. The harsh reality of our situation had dawned on us. We had inadvertently awakened an ancient curse that now threatened not only ourselves but also the town of Sheridan and its inhabitants. Sure of its persistence and relentless nature, we resolved to seek experts on Native American folklore and history upon our hopeful return as our only hope of putting an end to this terrifying nightmare before more lives were shattered by the monstrous Michigaraguay.
It all began on a calm evening in a small town in Wyoming. I was sitting at my favorite corner booth in the local bar, nursing a cold beer. My name is Lakota Black Elk, by the way, quite a rare name, if you asked me. The bar always felt like a second home for me, not that I was an alcoholic or anything like that. But lately, I have been frequenting the place more often than usual as I try to fill the void left behind after the recent breakup with my fiancé. As people came and went, laughing and sharing stories about their day, I couldn't help but overhear a group of construction workers from out of town who were talking about strange incidents that occurred near their work site. At first, I tried to ignore them. After all, I didn't want any company or problems. Until one of them let slip that whatever was causing the trouble was no ordinary human. Naturally skeptical, I wondered what kind of folkloric creature they had stumbled upon. I wasted no time pondering over such things. I easily dismissed it and continued nursing my drink. But it wasn't long before my curiosity got the better of me. Three days later, in the middle of another sleepless night, I decided to visit the construction site for myself, just in case there was something real behind those claims. As a Cheyenne native, I had grown up with tales not only about ghosts and spirits, but also about creatures predicted by the elders, those who walked among us with darkness hidden deep inside their hearts. As moonlight filtered through thick clouds above me, bathing everything in an eerie haze that seemed to tighten its grip on every single sound around me, something caught my eye up ahead near a newly dug ditch. What looked like clumps of dirty matted fur lay piled up by the entrance, some of which still seemed to be oozing fresh blood. Cautiously, I moved closer. Suddenly, the chill vanished from the air as my breathing picked up speed. The pieces of fur had a purplish tint to them, unlike any animal I'd seen. As much as I wanted to run back to my truck and get out of there, I knew that it was time for me to face this terror. Collecting a sample of the fur and a chunk of its bloodied skin, I turned to leave, only to find myself faced with a group of concerned locals who had been keeping an eye on the construction site, none other than those guys from the bar. Apparently, they too were worried about these strange happenings. We exchanged details of our encounters and decided to go talk to old man Red Willow, who was known for his vast knowledge of Cheyenne folklore and local legends. While tales say he was as old as the hills themselves, he still had the sharpest mind around. With the townsfolk following me, we wandered through dusty streets until we found Red Willow outside his home, smoking a pipe as though waiting for us. When we shared our findings with him, his eyes clouded over in recognition. With bated breaths, we listened as he spoke about a creature called is to Jiko, an ancient being that was once highly skilled at tracking prey. However, over time, corrupted by darkness, is to Jiko turned into something more sinister than its original purpose. In order to protect ourselves from this dark creature stalking us all from within our own town's borders, Red Willow instructed us to make ointments and talismans imbued with power to help protect against is to Jiko's lethal touch. Two days later, while heading home after one of many tiring nights spent preparing for battle against Istajiko's threat, I stopped dead in my tracks, feeling its presence close by. My heart raced as fear froze my limbs. The atmosphere turned heavy with the stench of decay and the whispers of the dead ancestors, whose bones lay entangled beneath the soft earth. For a split second, I was unsure if all this was just a manifestation of my own fear. Then I saw it, not too far from me, a darkness so thick that it seemed to have swallowed even the moonlight. Instinctively, I gripped the talisman Red Willow had helped me create and silently whispered my prayers, preparing myself for what was about to unfold. 
As adrenaline coursed through my veins, I remembered that no matter how dark and frightening this creature was, we were not defenseless against it. Drawing strength from the talisman and the protective ointments I had applied, I faced the entity head-on. As the shadowy figure started to close in on me, I chanted the sacred words taught to me by old man Red Willow. A brilliant light engulfed my body, creating a barrier between me and Iztajiko. The creature hissed and snarled as it realized my newfound power against its darkness. Gathering courage, I lunged at it, reciting the ancient chants that slowly burned away at its evil core. With each step I took, the once powerful hunter began to dwindle into a weakened state, screeching in agony. As the last remnants of Iztajiko dissipated into nothingness, a peaceful silence enveloped the town once more. Weariness set in as my adrenaline began to subside, but I knew that our town was finally safe from this terror that had been lurking in its shadows. In the days that followed, I gathered again with the townsfolk at Old Man Red Willow's home to reflect upon our harrowing experience. It was evident that we were stronger together, and our bonds had been fortified by this life-altering encounter. From that moment forward, we resolved that we would face any darkness or fear that threatened our town with unyielding courage and unwavering unity. And so ends my tale of the night when I faced this Tajiko, a testament to what can be accomplished when esoteric knowledge meets unwavering courage. As for me, a Lakota black elk, well, let's just say I found purpose beyond chasing away shadows and became something of a local legend myself one who would forever protect our town from malevolent forces lurking just beyond its borders. It was well past midnight when I found myself at that lonely gas station on a remote stretch of road outside of Lander, Wyoming. My name's Kieran Tumoons, and I'm a Cheyenne Native American working as a geologist. It wasn't the most thrilling job, but it suited me well enough. That night, the only source of light was the dim glow from the flickering street lamps. As I fumbled for my wallet to pay for the gas, an old trucker with leathery skin walked in, his steel-toed boots clanking against the floor. He flashed a crooked smile at me and asked if he could smoke a cigarette. We chatted about nothing important, how these old back roads were better than highways, how work-life balance didn't exist anymore, and how technology had taken over our lives. Then he mentioned something odd about strange occurrences on these isolated roads. He said he'd seen things that made him sick to his stomach, mutilated cattle and deer with no logical explanation. He told me to be cautious and bid me farewell. I drove along the winding dirt path, laughing at what he had said earlier. Our conversation felt more like an old campfire tale my grandfather used to tell than a warning. But as the night deepened, I found myself driving slower, keeping an eye out for those unexplainable carcasses. The hours crept by until I came across dark tire tracks veering off into a dense forest. Curiosity got the better of me. I parked my car and ventured in with nothing but my flashlight and cautious footsteps for company. The deeper I went into the forest, the landscape seemed less natural. Or maybe my paranoia heightened my senses. The air grew thick with an ominous presence as unspeakable horrors danced at the periphery of my imagination. Then I found it, a mutilated deer carcass twisted and torn by something other than humans. It was unsettling, to say the least. I heard footsteps approaching from behind and instinctively turned. I came face to face with a haggard old man named Jerry Taylor, owner of a nearby roadside motel. He confronted me, accusing me of desecrating the wildlife in his area. His eyes burned with suspicion and anger. Before I could explain myself, 
Another sound startled us, a horrific guttural growl echoing through the trees, followed by a loud crash as something enormous hit the ground nearby. We were both terrified by the creature that stepped out from the shadows, clear for us to see. It was a horrifying depiction of the Wendigo, an Algonquian native folklore creature that I had only ever heard about in bedtime stories. The Wendigo towered over us, its antlered head covered in matted fur like an unholy collision between deer and man. Its limbs were unnaturally long, ending in razor-sharp claws that glinted under the ominous moonlight. Jerry muttered a desperate prayer under his breath as we watched the creature stalk closer with chilling purpose. I struggled to remember my grandfather's tales, how he defeated monstrous creatures using wit and quick thinking. Desperate and out of options, I yelled at Jerry to run back to his motel and lock himself inside. I'd take care of distracting this creature so he had time to escape. As it lunged for us, I drew its attention away from Jerry by tossing rocks and branches in its direction. For hours, it felt like a lifetime. I did everything I could to evade the hellish beast while Jerry made his way back to safety. The Wendigo's persistence was relentless, and weariness threatened to overpower me. As dawn broke over the horizon, whether by luck or divine intervention, my frantic attempts led me back to my car parked on that secluded dirt road. I raced to the driver's seat, started the engine, and erupted onto the highway, the Wendigo hot on my trail. It slowed its pursuit only as I entered more populated areas, disappearing into the distance like a phantom from a myth. Exhausted and shaken, I made my way back to Jerry's motel for solace. Days later, recounting these events to a local park ranger, I learned that many individuals in the area had experienced eerily similar encounters with this creature. Stories of terror and fearful apparitions on these dark rural roads swirled through communities like folklore-drenched whispers, creating a ghostly legend no one dared speak of openly. As the days turned into weeks, the chilling memories of that night began to fade, slowly replaced by the mundane demands of my job as a geologist. Yet every now and then, as I traveled down desolate roads and through eerie forests for work, those horrifying memories would resurface, crawling up from the depths of my subconscious like tendrils of dread. The overwhelming primal fear that gripped me during those moments reminded me of how deeply the encounter with the Wendigo had affected my once steadfast and practical mind. No longer could I dismiss old legends as mere fabrications invented to elicit fear or amusement. I became engrossed in researching Native American folklore, searching for answers to the unsolved mysteries hinted at by those whispered rural tales. My newfound obsession led me down a rabbit hole of arcane knowledge, bringing me closer to a truth I had once brushed aside as mere fantasy. And despite having witnessed firsthand the monstrous abomination that haunts Wyoming's barren highways and secluded forests, darkened by both nature's cruelty and man's insatiable curiosity, I couldn't shake an undying flame of fascination with the menacing supernatural world lurking just beyond our perception. It was then that I knew my life had been irrevocably changed by that fateful encounter on those eerie backroads. What was once a mundane existence was now colored by shadows of inexplicable danger, forcing me to walk a fine line between terror and intrigue in pursuit of understanding. Little did I know that this would be only my first glimpse into a world far stranger than anything I could have ever imagined. I couldn't believe my eyes as I stumbled upon the scene. It was around 7 p.m. on a Friday in a small town in Wyoming. A few friends and I were driving around, just killing time before meeting up with some other people at a bar later that night. My name is Nick in Redfeather, by the way, 
and I've lived in this town my whole life. So, where exactly are we heading? Asked Marissa, one of my friends sitting in the back seat. I'm not sure yet, I replied. We thought we'd take the scenic route. My friends Ethan and Jake were up front with me. We were all just looking for something to do, not anticipating anything out of the ordinary happening that night. Little did we know what was coming. We turned down an old, wooded road that I'd driven down countless times before. Everything seemed normal until we noticed a strong, foul smell permeating the air. The rotten stench was so overpowering that I had to roll the windows up and turn on the air conditioning. What the hell is that smell? Ethan cried out. I have no idea, I said. This is really strange. We followed the smell to its source, an abandoned cabin deep within the woods. It was old and dilapidated, long since forgotten by time. Curiosity got the better of us as we ventured closer for a better look. Finding the door slightly ajar, we hesitantly entered with our phone flashlights on, each step creaking underfoot. Lay low and see if there's a clue or something, Jake whispered as he trailed behind me. The nauseating smell intensified as we entered another room with thick, dark fluid smeared across the walls and floors. We noticed disturbing symbols etched into every surface and suddenly realized that there appeared to be blood everywhere. Guys, this looks like a freaking murder scene, Marissa said, her voice wavering with fear. Ethan turned to me with a look of desperation and said, Nikon, what do you think we should make of all this? Should we be worried? As I tried to figure out how to respond, I heard something rustling in the corner, and there it was, a creature ripped straight from the depths of my people's folklore, the Wendigo. It had an emaciated body with a deer-like skull for a face and antlers protruding from its head. The smell was beyond words. It reeked of rotting flesh. At that moment, it lunged at Ethan. Reacting just in time, I pushed him against the wall and barely avoided getting hit by this beast as it screeched angrily. Fear took over as we sprinted out of there for dear life. The next few weeks were filled with dread and paranoia as the Wendigo hunted us relentlessly. Eerie noises and mutilated animals showed up near our homes, leaving us in a constant state of fear. By chance, Marissa discovered that a local resident named David Hawks knew about Wendigos. We visited him for answers, hoping to put an end to this torment. David explained that long ago, there had been whispers about this monster preying on human flesh and dishonoring the spirits. As he spoke about how Wendigos were once humans who turned into monsters due to their insatiable hunger for flesh, I couldn't help but wonder how he knew all these details. The truth was finally uncovered after multiple encounters and narrow escapes with death. David's great-grandfather had been cursed as the Wendigo when he confessed to cannibalism during a desperate time back in the old days. Judging by his behavior, David said solemnly. He's giving up his fight against the agonizing pain that tells him to feed upon mere mortals. That night we took down the Wendigo, painstakingly following David's instruction to use a prepared spear made of native wood to pierce its heart and incantations to trap its spirit. As the Wendigo let out a blood-curdling screech, my entire body trembled with the adrenaline coursing through my veins. With great determination, we buried his remains at the source of the curse, where his story began. The chilling encounter that nearly cost us our lives will forever be ingrained in our memories. We'd faced something no one could have imagined, something rooted in deep legends spanning generations. Sometimes I still shudder when I drive down that old wooded road, remembering the terror we once faced. But life eventually went on, and we all learned to embrace the fear as a reminder of just how fragile the boundary between myth and reality can be.
Some say that the Wendigo was just an old legend, but we knew better, and we carried the burden of this gruesome truth with us. From that point forward, our little group was bound by an unspoken understanding that we had faced the darkness together, and that no matter what other hidden monsters lurked in the shadows, our friendship would help light our way through any trials that might come. But years went by, and strangely enough, we started to drift apart. The weight of what we'd encountered pulled at our bonds like gravity until they frayed and snapped. Eventually, I left Wyoming in search of a different life elsewhere. And as I carried on far from home, I would occasionally feel haunted by a faint whisper of that foul smell, reminding me to always stay vigilant, no matter where my journey took me.